we're calling to order the, uh, the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for October 19th, 2020. As a preliminary matter, this is John Hurd, Select Board Chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Here, thank you. Joe Curl? Here. Steve DeCourcy? Here. And Lynn Diggins? Here. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine? Here. Doug Heim? Here. And Board Administrator Ashley Marr is participating remotely. Good evening. This open meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conduct conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth, given the outbreak of the novel coronavirus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend, suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such, such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Even if members of the public do not provide comment, participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. For this meeting, the select board is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please also take care to adjust your screen or device name if you would like to speak. In order for us to recognize speakers appropriately and develop accurate minutes, it is helpful for, for participants to see your full first and last name when calling upon you rather than a nickname. All of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available on the no Novus Agenda dashboard. We recommend the members of the public follow along the agenda as posted on Novus unless the chair notes otherwise. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motion. Please hold until your name is called Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If any members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. This meeting will feature opportunities for public comment on certain agenda items. For public comment items, after members have spoken, I as the chair will afford the public opportunities as follows. I will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all public commentators, I will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comments. Please be, keep in mind that all participants and members of the public must be recognized by the chair before speaking. Finally, each vote taken in, in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. So that takes us to the items on our agenda. Before we do so, I just want to make a couple of announcements. We do have Warren article hearings that are coming up later in the night. For anybody that wishes to speak on Article 8 regarding the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and Article 25 about the Black Lives Matter banner on Town Hall, both articles, we the proponents of both articles have reached out to us and asked us to table these to the next meeting. They're not ready to present the articles tonight. So if you're here to speak on those two articles, those articles will be posted on our next agenda. And just a minor item, we have number seven on our agenda regarding the shared streets project that Brooks have. 
that item was just meant to be posted as correspondence received, so we won't have a discussion or vote on that item. So that will take us to our consent agenda. We have two items on the consent agenda. We are going to take them individually tonight. So item number two is a request for a contractor drain layer license from New England Pipe Restoration Inc, 157 Lincoln Street, Leominster, Massachusetts. And I'll turn to Mrs. Mahan. Move approval, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And Mr. DeCourcy? A second. Mr. Curl, any comments or questions? None, thank you. And Mr. Diggins, any comments or questions? None. Attorney Hyde? Ms. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Curl? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Thank you. And that takes us to item number two on our agenda. And for this, I'll first reach out to if any members have any questions or comments prior. Mr. Carl? Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, I wish to um, recuse myself from this item due to uh, a conflict of interest. All right, thank you. And the record will reflect that at this time, Mr. Carl has muted himself and removed his video from the feed. All right, so we have on our regular agenda an appointment, the appointment of new election workers. We have Margaret Eskridge, 121 Appleton Street, Precinct 16, and Jeffrey Zimmer, 40 Grandview Road, Precinct 16. We also had on our emergency addendum that was posted the appointment of additional election workers. We have Sierra Curl. 21 Millet Street, Precinct 13, Carol Cohen, 256 Renfrew Street, Precinct 12, Charlotte Dowd, 182 Palmer Street, Precinct 5, Catherine Guys, 38 Johnson Street, Johnson Road rather, Precinct 11. We have Hannah Faith Kelmhofer, 489 Summer Street, Precinct 19. We have Matthew Mays, 126 Warren Street, Precinct 10. And we have Julie Powers, 10 Mayflower Road, Precinct 12. I will turn to Mr. Diggins. I will motion to approve the um, new election workers. Thank you. And Mr. DeCourcy? Second. And Mrs. Mahan, any comments or questions? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Attorney Hyde? Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Curo? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Curo is not involved in this vote. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's a 4 0 vote, and I declare so. Thank you. And we will wait for Mr. Curo if he can hear us. Thank you. And the re record will reflect that Mr. Curo is now back with us. So this takes us to public hearings at item number four on the agenda. We have a kennel license petition at 59 Thesda Street from Alyssa O'Rourke of 65 Thesda Street. We do have materials in here. At this time, I'll ask Mr. Town Manager if you can promote Captain Flynn, who's done some work on this item. Captain Flynn, can you hear us? I can. Great, thank you. I'll first turn to Attorney Heim for a little background on this particular item. So uh, for the board's uh, information and the general public's information, the long and short of it is that um, when uh, folks have a complaint about a kennel and they write to the select board, there's a sort of statutory process that requires the select board to have an initial sort of opening of a discussion about that um, complaint. And the board basically has two options. It can refer the matter for uh, investigation uh, to the police department and essentially get a report and recommendation back, or the board can attempt to hear the um, complaint and make a decision that 
the, uh, that they'll take no action, that they'll modify or suspend a, a kennel license, or that they'll um, revoke a license. But those are the basic two courses of action at this initial stage. Uh, to my understanding, and I assume that Captain Flynn will speak to this, the police department has done some uh, preliminary investigations and has given some uh, time for compliance. And I'll leave that to uh, Captain Flynn to address. But again, the, the sort of two options are that the board can refer for uh, further investigation or the board can decide to try to address the substance uh, this evening based on the information that it has. All right, and Thank I'll you. turn it to Captain Flynn for just some background of the matter and then the current status of the investigation. Good evening. Um, so uh, for the last month or so, I have been overseeing the animal control officer and uh, back in August, on the 19th of August, the animal control officer and representative from the uh, Board of Health had gone out to do an inspection, a kennel inspection out of 59 Fesno. Uh, later that afternoon, so this was a uh, kennel license for eight animals on the property. Later that afternoon, uh, the dogs got loose and uh, they were running amok kind of in the neighborhood and uh, there was a uh, report of a potential bite to another dog. Uh, I was on the road at that time, so I went out to the location with the animal control officer and uh, met with the, uh, with the owners and uh, I did a walkthrough on the property. So um, it, it immediately came to, uh, you know, it, it was quick to understand that the fencing in the yard was an issue. Um, there was a lot of brush. There was a lot of debris in the backyard. Um, there was also several abandoned vehicles in the backyard. Uh, but uh, the fencing had a lot of brush and the dogs had made their way through a couple of the areas of the fence. So uh, I, I informed the owners you know, by this time they had the animals under control and in the house that um, the fencing in the yard and the gate were, were really substandard for what they were looking for. Um, I uh, informed them that if they wanted to, if they, we wanted to re, uh, go back, go with that kind of license and renew that kind of license that he was going to have to address that and also the debris in the yard to make sure that the animals were safe. Uh, that was on the 19th of August. Uh, we went back out to visit that home. Um, in September, um, actually in September on the 23rd, we needed to move that appointment and we went back out there on August, uh, October 9th. Uh, so um, the owners had put a lot of work into the backyard. They had uh, put up a brand new fence. Uh, the property abuts the back of uh, McLennan Park. So there was a, a good existing fence in the back of McLennan Park, but everything else kind of was makeshift. Uh, they put in brand new fencing from the corners of the home to the lot lines and ran them all the way out to that fence. And it's a big property, it's a double lot. Um, so they had, made, they had made a good deal of progress and they had begun the process of cleaning up the yard. Um, we uh, gave them um, some more guidance and suggested that they continue the work at the house and clean up the debris in the yard. There was still some sharp metal fencing and uh, still a vehicle in the yard, a, a large tractor, not a small tractor, a, a, a full-size tractor and um, some other debris. So um, the gist of it is, is that the property owners and the, and the kennel license holders have done a great deal of work out at that property. Probably, it, not probably, but more so than we've even asked. You know, they put up uh, a fence, but they not only put up a fence, they put up a material at the base of the fence with, to keep the dogs from digging to go underneath the fence. They also uh, put in a barrier like a slats that would uh, keep the view between the two yards. Um, to a minimum. So they, they've really gone above and beyond um, what we've asked them to this point. We have one more date, a final date at the end of the month on the 30th that we're going to go out and do a final inspection. Uh, today I went out and did kind of an unannounced visit and saw that um, they continue to make progress. A lot of the fencing and the material had been cleaned up. The tractor was off the property. Uh, they have a landscaper supposedly coming out tomorrow to uh, chip a lot of the brush and whatnot they've removed. They've done uh, really kind of above and beyond where I thought they would be at this point. Uh, one more uh, visit on the, at the end of the month uh, should make a determination, I think, of, of whether really um, they should continue with that license or not. Um, there's also been um, a little bit of uh, back and forth between this neighbor and uh, a neighbor next door, and um, that's seemed to have come under control as well. Some signage issues, putting signs up on their uh, fence line towards each other, and that seems to have subsided. Um, 
At least that's what I noticed today in my visit. So uh, again, the animal control officer and myself have a visit scheduled on the 30th. And uh, at this point, it looks like the owners are, uh, are doing everything that we're asking them to do uh, to adhere to the kennel license. Thank you, Captain Flynn. And I will turn to the board for any questions of Captain Flynn. Mr. Carroll? No, th thank you, Captain. Thank you for the, uh, the, the update. Um, and thank you for the report. Um, it looks like this, this particular situation has occupied a lot of your time and, and the ACO and, and uh, I saw Officer uh, Dundit Sung in there as well. Um, so I, I appreciate your persistence um, on this. Um, and I think that you've, you've answered all of my questions around the current state of, of, uh, of the property. So I'm gonna sit back, Mr. Chair, and I, you know, once we go through the round of questions for uh, Captain Karn, I'd like to hear from the uh, petitioner, or at least one of the petitioners, um, as well what the nature of the, um, the current complaint is for the board. Thank you. Ms. Mahan? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And similar to Mr. Carroll's um, remarks, Captain Flynn and uh, um, Diane Welch obviously have spent a, a lot of time on this. Um, in, ter in terms of the kennel, as of today, how many dogs are in the kennel, um, Captain Flynn? To uh, Mr. The Chair. The kennel license is for eight animals, eight. That's eight. Um, I, I understand that um, you spoke about it's a double lot. There's been a, a lot of yard cleanup. There's been some fencing um, uh, erected, but there also was um, brush debris and, and a vehicle issue. What is the status of, of those two issues? So there was a, a full-size tractor in the backyard along with a trailer, the um, full-size tractor, which hadn't uh, been started in probably 10 years, um, has been removed from the property. Um, there's still a trailer that is in the yard that is um, scheduled to be moved this week. There's a large area of brush uh, in the center of the yard, and this was really um, developed because there was, there was a lot of brush along the, um, the fence line, and I would imagine the fence company who put in the fence um, asked that that be removed so that they could put in the fence. Uh, so there's a large kind of a brush pile in the middle of the yard. Uh, the, uh, the animal owners or the kennel license uh, holders have a landscaper coming out with a chipper, they tell me tomorrow, to take care of that brush pile. Um, and again, there was uh, apparently a dumpster on the property for a while. They removed a lot of old fencing, a lot of old metal that was in the yard at the time. And uh, it's an ongoing process. Uh, but they have they have made significant gains. And, and thank you, Captain Flynn. Just two other questions. Um, in terms of any um, biting incidents from the dogs mm -hmm. in this kennel, am I correct that there was one and it was dog on dog, or was there something beyond that? Uh, there was a reported bite, um, but uh, I, the ACO informs me that it, it actually, she did not believe that was a bite, nor did she ever receive a bite notice. Um, she believes it was maybe uh, one dog taking another dog in the mouth. There was saliva, but uh, she does not believe that there was a bite nor she received any notice. And if there is uh, an animal brought to a veterinary from the community, the animal control officer is made aware of that. So she has not uh, received any bite notices from that property. Okay, thank you, Captain. My last question would be, and I'm not trying to be trivial, I'm just looking um, Captain Flynn and ACO officer and others have, have provided us with a lot of information. I know there's been an issue of signs between neighbors abutting each other. Um, I don't know if you could speak to whether that's been resolved, but the, my reading is it's anybody's right to put whatever sign they want to put out. I don't know if you have any positive news on that. Actually, I do. So um, there, there's some uh, video surveillance cameras that are used at the property and there was some video surveillance signage that was on the, the fence, but it, it really wasn't, uh, it wasn't professional signing. It was, it, it was more kind of uh, smile, you're on camera, that type of signage. So I suggested to the, uh, to the owners to put up a, some professional signage on the fence and saying, you know, 
uh, area under video surveillance. Uh, when they put up their signs, they put up more signs than recommended. Um, and uh, the next door neighbors then put up some signs facing their home, kind of saying that they were blocking the other signs. Uh, I believe it was on a Sunday, last Sunday, the 11th, uh, that I got a call on my cell phone and I uh, happened to be uh, out and about and I stopped by and there was a number of signs on the fences, on both sides of the fences. Um, so I spoke, I spoke to both of the residents and um, looks like I convinced them to uh, remove the signs. We get one sign up on each side of the property, one you know, basically facing each neighbor, one facing McClendon Park, in one of the one or two in the front house uh, facing the front of the street, just letting people know that there are cameras in the area and they're under surveillance. So, um, again, visit today, unannounced visit today, only one sign really where we asked them to put it. So, uh, it seems like that is taking care of itself. And, um, you know, this is this is an ongoing, it's, it's not just the dogs, which I'm trying to help a neighborhood in a way, try so that, you know. Hopefully, uh, these people can get along a little bit better. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more enjoyable for the people in McClendon Park when they walk by to be able to see. And, uh, and in the end, hopefully, the, the kennel owners will have a, you know, a cleaned up piece of property that, that they can be proud of, too. So it's a little bit more than just this. But uh, again, I, I think they're moving in the right direction. And uh, I hope that, uh, that uh, the neighbors can get along there. I don't know whether that will ever really happen, but, but that is my hope. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Captain Flynn. I don't mean to be picky and, and, and bring up all these issues, but these have been all the issues of the neighbors, but I, I, I certainly am um, grateful that you're, you're working not only with the neighborhood, but for the neighborhood to try to get some peace and some calm and some continuity to work together. So I think this is a, a issue neighborhood. Um, in, in action that, that we need to continue on with. Um, and I appreciate all the time and future time that you <laughs> and others on the APD, um, including the um, animal control officer need to put on this. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Yeah, thank, you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, quick question, uh, so just a little historical context. So this kennel came into existence because the owner had a uh, dog or a couple dogs and then they had puppies and they kept all the puppies and so it was a place that wasn't a kennel but then when they had the puppies they decided to keep them it became a kennel that's correct sir okay all right thanks yeah. and mr corsi uh, thank you mr chairman first of all thank you captain flynn for the detailed police report and and the pictures that you took on october 9th it really did gave us a good context and i i was out at the property or on the McClellan Field side of it over the weekend. And I did notice a big difference um, from the date you, that you took the pictures in, in, until this weekend. So I know this has been a, a, a difficult situation going back and forth between the neighbors and we appreciate the work that you're doing on that. And um, just a couple of questions on, in your report, you cite the October 30th date as the date you'll be returning to the property to see what progress has been made. The abutting neighbor is aware of that date as well, and, and um, I, I, I know you spoke with them on October 11th, but i just wondering, since the 11th, has there been any further need to go out other than your announced visit today? Uh, no, not, not since the 11th. Um, again, today uh, was uh, just kind of uh, an unannounced visit so that I could have a uh, perspective of the property as of today, so that knowing that what I would be uh, here tonight. So, uh, again, that was uh, just to kind of a stop in and see where things are at, and it, so that there were no changes. I really hadn't heard anything um, since the 11th on the property. I know there's some other things going on, but uh, related to this, no, no. Okay. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you, and thank you, Captain Flynn, for all your work on this. I know this is taking up a good amount of your time, and we appreciate the work that you're doing here. Um, just one question in general. How many of these kennel licenses do we have in Arlington, if you know? I, I, to be honest, I don't know, to okay. be honest. All right, thank you. All right, um, so Ms. Talmadge, if you can promote Mrs. O'Rourke, um, we'll have her speak on the issue for three minutes, take questions from the board, 
and then we'll hear from the other party. Hi. Um, so first off, this is uh, Dan O'Rourke. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk on behalf of my wife, uh, if that's okay. How are you? Sure. If you could just you said your name, say your property address. Just so. sure. My name is Daniel O'Rourke, and I live at 65 Thesa Street, uh, which is the property abutting uh, the, uh, uh, the property here under, under question. So I really appreciate everyone's time this evening. And I want to address, obviously, um, kind of why you know, the petition was created by 25 people in the community all of whom, all of whom live in, in close proximity to this property. So there's really two major elements to the reason why this was filed. Um, there's really obviously the danger that these dogs present, um, but also it's also a concept of the breach of the peace issue with the noise that these dogs also present as well. So we've lived next door to them for about seven years. Um, over the course of the last seven years, we have asked them on a personal level and have asked the police to become involved uh, on many other levels to, to try to get them to stop the dogs of which eight of the, and there are eight of them, uh, to stop their incessant barking every time a human being or dog walks by their property. And the problem is, as someone just pointed out very accurately, uh, the property, it, it borders uh, the Clendon Field. So there's a dog or a human being walking by every five minutes. Every time that happens, the dogs lose their minds. Their dogs were never socialized with other people or with other animals. So they are not, they think that anything that walks by is a threat. Um, and when this used to go on at 4.30 in the morning, 4.45 in the morning for, for years, um, the lack of care that the owners of that property showed their neighbors when they allowed their dogs to go outside and literally bark their heads off at anything that walks by is insane. I, I'm sure there isn't anyone on this phone call who would say they wouldn't be mortified if a single dog, let alone eight dogs, were outside um, barking ferociously at anyone who moved past them. The reason why we're actually having this entire conversation today is that we have three children. Our youngest is a seven-year-old daughter who goes uh, to Pierce, obviously. We bought her a puppy. When the dogs saw the puppy on our property, they absolutely saw that as a threat. Four of their dogs invaded our property, and my brother-in-law, who had two of his dogs here at the time, uh, were, uh, were also on the property, and the dogs made every single solitary effort they could to come onto the property and they finally succeeded. It was like the Marines hitting the beach. One of the owners was actually in the yard and watched it all happen. Um, my brother-in-law would be more than happy to attest to what happened. His dog was attacked. His dog fled as soon as these dogs showed up. That he, their dog pursued that dog up the stairs to our porch. Uh, my brother-in-law is a phenomenal athlete. He's a nationally ranked tennis player. He barely got the dog out of the dog's jaws for tragedy struck. If my daughter had been outside with our puppy by herself when those four dogs invaded our property, uh, it could have been exactly what happened to Bridger Walker, uh, which I'm sure you can go and look, up, look that up. A great question was asked a, a moment ago, why in God's name does anybody have eight dogs? I, and by the way, I have to imagine this is the only property in the town that has a commercial, has a, has a license in order to have eight dogs. They, they don't have them because they're breeders. They don't have them because they're running a, running a uh, um, a, a, you know, a, a process where they're trying to help, help dogs. They're, they have them there because of their negligence. Uh, they, they kept every puppy. And like I said, these dogs are, are extremely- So okay, just coming on three minutes, if you can wrap up and then we'll go yeah. to the board for questions. All right, so, so, so there's two major things, the nuisance factor, and there's no margin for error. If those dogs get out again, uh, they could absolutely go after another, another child or another dog. Um, the fencing has, is appropriate and that's very helpful. But the problem is they can get out in many other ways. Um, and have done so even after the fence and even after it was reinforced has happened to get out through their garage uh, and, and because the garage abuts you know, the backyard. The police have done their job. Uh, Captain Flynn has done a phenomenal job, um, but unfortunately this is the, as you mentioned, this is how this gets decisioned uh, is, is uh, through this body here. So we appreciate your time this evening and uh, uh, happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. All right, I uh, will turn to the board, Mr. Carroll. Um, thank you very much. Um, so with the, the, the barking issues, have you, <clears throat> are, are you saying that the dogs are left out most of the night or because you, you, you said it's fairly early in the morning that they... Uh, They'll let the dogs out very early in the morning, uh, but they also leave them out all day. Uh, so, and obviously we're all trying to work from home these days. So the, the, yeah, the, the dogs could be barking, eight, eight dogs can be barking at any moment, pretty much day or night. Um, 
<clears throat> and obviously the remedy you're looking for is the removal of all of the dogs. Right now, the remedy that we're looking for, well, first off, we don't want any harm to come to these dogs. Obviously, yeah. we, that is not what we're doing here today. What we're doing here today is to try to find some remedy that exists where um, a kennel license for eight dogs is not necessary in a densely populated neighborhood surrounded by families with children. The 25 people who signed this, if you were to interview all of them, they would all tell you they're worried about the danger to their children and they're worried and they're, and they're really fed up with the noise. No one should have eight dogs in a densely populated neighborhood. So. Okay. I, I don't think I have any further questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank, 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 thank you, Mr. O'Rourke. Mrs. Mahan? Um, I guess my question, um, and I hate to do this to Captain Flynn, would be, because uh, there's some ambiguity here, do you see is the the petition from the 25 residents they're asking us has there been a, a kennel of eight permit issued to this um residence and um is that what you're hearing or your interpretation of what they're asking so my interpretation is that this was a, a renewal for an ongoing kennel license. Okay. Um, and again, there was a, a visit to the property earlier in the day on August 19th, on, on August 19th, um, where uh, the ACO and a member of the Board of Health had gone out and viewed the property. And then that day, later in that day, there was the escape that I believe that Mr. Rook was talking about, um, which brought my attention to it and really brought my involvement to it. And, and, and when I went out, I, I strictly looked at the uh, the two points that, that some of the two original points that are on the license is one is uh, is it secure and two is it safe um, at that point I, I I determined that I didn't think it was secure and that's why uh, we asked the kennel owners to address the fencing issue or at least make a decision you know we, uh, the same uh, with, with you Mr. O'Rourke that I said listen you have eight dogs um, this this is your decision but I mean, there was some great expense spent on that fencing, and I, and I, I was I was a little shocked that they they went that route, but they did. Um, so they repaired the fencing, um, but then with new fencing came a clear view through both yards um, until uh, the owners of the kennel put some slats in it. But still, the dogs, I, you know, they they can sense when there's another dog on the other side of the fence, and they can still see out into McLennan Park. Um, so my my view on it, my, uh, what I was attempting to do was make sure that one, the kennel was secure and two, that the kennel was safe within that. And hopefully by doing that, I, I might be able to improve maybe the, the relations, but at least what's going on in the neighborhood. Um, but um, I, I, I understand Mr. O, Mr. and Mrs. O'Rourke's concerns in regards to the barking and the noise and what have you. Um, I don't know how uh, you address that, um, but uh, as far as what we were looking in the kennel license wise, uh, that's what we were trying to do. Okay, and I, I don't know, <laughs> this is probably going further in depth than, than we need to, but um, in terms of these um, eight canines, which I'm concerned about the neighbors and also about the canines, um, because there seems to be so much issue of them being outside um, in terms of whether, is the outside of this kennel that has eight canines set up that that's where they're going to be for the uh, late fall, early winter. I would imagine so. At least, at least during the course of the daytime, I believe the animals are all brought in at home, in, into the home at night. Um, again, I don't know exactly when they're putting the animals out in the um, in the yard in the morning, and uh, how late they're staying out at night. I, you know, I pulled some numbers for the last year of how many calls we've had out in that neighborhood um, for some animal complaints. But um, again, my focus. Uh, was at the, at the time that the dogs were breaking through the fence and escaping and not only um, getting onto the O'Rourke property, but they were running amok in, in the neighborhood. So there were, there were other concerns there. So that's what I, we immediately addressed that. And if the kennel license was going to be renewed, the yard needed to be made more safe and in, in essence, basically cleaned up. And if you can, 
in the past three, six, 12 months, how many noise or other complaints um, have you gotten regarding? Sorry, um, did my question get through or should I try again? It kind, of, it, it kind of broke up, but I think you were going how many, in maybe this last six, 12 months, how many noise complaints that we got out in that area. Um, well, I pulled the numbers for uh, 65 and uh, in 59, uh, the, the neighbors, and uh, 59, there were 14 total calls to that home over the course of the year. Um, four or five, five of them had to do with barking dogs or dogs escaping. Um, and then pulled the, um, for, uh, for the Aurora residents, and there were five total. Uh, four of those had to do with um, either the dogs escaping or barking. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm still sort of struggling, you know, if I were to make the motion right now, it sounds like Captain Flynn and ACO Welch are um, working with the neighbors, um, but I don't want to uh, appear as though I'm, I'm, I'm minimizing um, the O'Rourke's and other neighbors' um, concerns in this area. So I'll, I guess I'd look to my colleagues in terms of questions they have and what motion comes out of that. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, so um, through you all the questions. Um, um, how, how long have the dogs been there? To whomever, you know, can answer that question. I think probably about six years, my guess. Six, six years, okay. Um, uh, so when the dogs almost attacked, you know, when, you, when your brother-in-law, was that reported? Yes. Uh, in fact, we called the animal control officer right then and there, um, learning that she had signed off on the property earlier that day. Okay. We called them immediately because we felt it was such a, a breach that uh, uh, that it was, and we knew that their fence uh, was insufficient, you know, to protect us. Um, we had warned them that we were getting a puppy in advance, and had been told that they would try to reinforce it. But it was a chicken wire fence, basically. Um, right. It didn't protect the fence. Cause harm. Gotcha. Um, so I, I guess maybe this question goes to uh, Mr. Hine. It, it's like I'm just trying to understand, I mean, um, why it is that the town would allow a kennel. Um, with that many dogs in that kind of environment, because it's kind of predictable be, that if you have that many dogs, be, um, there's going to be a noise issue. Be, and so, so, I mean, I think this problem, this needs to be solved at a different level. Be, uh, so, uh, it, but I'm just trying to understand maybe the rationale um, behind the bylaw or anything that allows such a thing to exist. Mr. Chairman? Yes. So, Mr. Diggins, um, under uh, the town bylaws, a uh, personal kennel license is mandatory for anybody who has more than five dogs, three months old. So I'm not sure what the genesis of the kennel license scheme schema is, but um, under our current bylaws, you have the option to get a kennel license if you have four or fewer dogs and uh, for five or more, um, you have to have a kennel license. So there are obviously some criteria for maintaining a kennel, uh, but uh, at present, um, we have a license available for folks who have, or want to have more than five dogs. Right, right. So you still, um, uh, to the um, town council again still. So then if one doesn't, get the kind of license you're limited to the number of dogs you can have that's correct so if you're not if you don't qualify for a personal kennel license you can't have that many dogs on so okay all right thank you very much that's it mr decorsi uh thank you mr chairman uh just a couple of questions from mr o'rourke um looking at the the citizens petition and i think we've touched on the issues with security and the fencing we've touched on excessive barking and and you reference other conditions um, that constitute a nuisance. Is there anything else beyond those two that have occurred um, since 2016? As I see that date referenced in the petition as well. Um, you know, I think I think the petition covers really the major issues that we wanted to bring up today. 
Okay. All right. And and I, I just want to clarify, did you say that since, um, well, let's go back to the beginning of the month, have, have the dogs escaped yes. within the last 10 days? Yes the, do yes, the dogs escaped. In fact, there was a, uh, um, uh, so after they, uh, on, on uh, we're actually looking at the, on 10-3, the dogs escaped again after the fence was put in and after it was reinforced. The dogs, ex dogs escaped again. When the neighbor, when my wife was standing in the front of our house, when the neighbor ran by chasing the dogs down the street, he said while he was running by that they just got out through the garage. The garage door opens into the backyard and the garage door had been left open. I won't tell you what he then later told a neighbor why they got out, but it was, uh, Essentially, you know, uh, it could easily be the, 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 uh, a defamation case. Easily, it could be a defamation case because he blamed my wife for it, uh, and, and it involved bolt cutters, which is literally insane. Um, but um, so, uh, you know, the, the fact that this going back to what I said, there's no margin for error. Um, if the dogs get out, then they certainly can. The fence is great, and I and I appreciate them doing that. But their negligence could result in them getting out. Through the, just simple, simple, not simply not closing, opening, uh, not closing a door. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Carl. Did you have an additional question? I actually do. I was actually holding up my fingers to say four. From my reading of the of the of the uh, bylaws. I just wanted to clarify through you with with counsel, if we we were to uh, revoke the kennel license. My understanding is that. Um, the dog owners would still be permitted to, to maintain four dogs license under the the usual um, procedures. A standard dog. And may I? Yes, that's correct, Mr. Carroll. Okay. And um, a, f a further question. Um, <clears throat> I know that uh, the the laws on vicious dog hearings, which we've only had a couple, I think, in the time that I've been on here, have changed over the last couple of years where um, <clears throat> really the only remedies available to us with a, uh, a vicious dog. And I don't think, I don't know if we're talking about it. This is, this is different. This isn't actually a vicious dog hearing. This is a kennel hearing. Um, so under a vicious dog hearing, I know that we're not allowed to uh, demand the, the transfer of, of an animal to, to another individual or, or out of town. We have to either uh, mandate um, additional um, humane constraints or, or um, putting down a euthanization. Uh, but, but that is not the requirement under, under this. Is, is that correct? If we were to lift the, 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 the kennel license and give a period of time, the, the dog owners essentially would have a period of time to 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 sell or or give away uh i guess four of the dogs in this case down down to a, a total of four mr chairman man yes that's correct mr curo so we're here on a kennel hearing um a dangerous dog hearing is would require another process and basically the remedies available um are more or less what you've described uh, and that would have to be specific to an animal we need to know right. sort Correct. of which dog, you know, was, you know, uh, allegedly bit or harmed another animal or a person. Um, so, yes, uh, in theory, if you uh, revoked this uh, Class A2 personal kennel license and um, they, you know, were to limit the number of dogs to four dogs, um, they could still keep four dogs under the current bylaw, notwithstanding any, you know, other concerns like a dangerous dog hearing with respect to one of the four dogs or all the four dogs, something of that nature. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then my further question then, I guess through you, Mr. Chair, to, to Mr. O'Rourke is would, uh, would a reduction in number address the, the, the situation? Because if the situation is negligence and keeping open the garage door or, or whatnot. I mean, it doesn't seem that the number of dogs would, would make a difference. Reading the report too, it looks like two of them are, are, are usually off during the day with um, one of the owners at work. Is that, is that correct? 
So we, we really don't know. Um, it doesn't seem to have a lot of consistency to that. But like I said, we, we don't want anything to happen to the dogs. We don't want them harmed in any way, shape, or form. We just want our safety assured and the nuisance factor somehow mediated. That's all we're asking for. So the number of dogs, if you took the license away, they would, get, they would have a smaller number of dogs and that could alleviate it in some respects. So. But it sounds like the, the, the core behaviors are really what ha have, to, uh, have to change. It's, it's not strictly an issue of the number of dogs other than the right. noise, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, and then my questions have been touched on, but the first one to Attorney Heim. So, for a resident or a personal kennel license, is there anything in there that talks about a commercial use, or is a personal kennel license <clears throat> just people that <clears throat> that specifically want to own more than four dogs for personal use? If that makes sense. So. A personal kennel license under the Arlington bylaws is basically just defined as a pack or a collection of more than five dogs, three months or older, um, owned and kept under um, single ownership for private personal purposes. That doesn't exclude um, folks from breeding dogs under a personal kennel license. Um, you know, for the purposes of like showing the breed or you know, sporting activity, but, um, and I believe they can also sell them, but there are some prohibitions on a personal kennel license that don't exist on a commercial breeder kennel or a commercial boarding or training kennel. So there are different standards for some of these things and they have different sort of operational um, parameters, I guess, is the best way I can put it um, in terms of the things that you're allowed to do and not allowed to do um, based on the type of kennel license you have. And as you mentioned, so do, under our bylaws, we also have separate commercial kennel licenses as well? We have um, several different types of other kennels from ranging from breeders and um, basically boarding or training kennels that you know would be oriented towards you know somebody boarding their dog if they went on out of town or you know places where folks bring their dog to be trained for a certain number of hours a day. Thank you. And Captain Flynn, just relative to the noise and putting aside the fact that we this is used as a personal kennel, what would be the remedy if a resident had say two or three dogs that with a, with a number of excessive noise complaints um, on that property. Um, or is there a remedy? I think I think there may be a few remedies. I think you know the animal control officer might be able to speak to the owners about uh, you know perhaps retraining. Um, you know there are devices that they can you you can purchase that to help kind of train the dogs in regards to the barking et cetera. A um, little bit on my realm, but yeah. I do think I do think there are some uh, some avenues that that can go. Uh, I, again, I understand eight dogs is is um, it's a great deal, but um, you know four dogs on the property as well. I think it, there's a very good chance that the four dogs could uh, make more noise than than folks want to hear. Um, today, when I was on the property, um, there were two. Uh, at times, three dogs on the in the backyard. Um, again, when I showed up, I was I was kind of very quiet, and I I just observed the property for a little while before. And uh, you know, the dogs were very well behaved. Uh, some people had walked by um, in McLennan Park. Uh, they didn't have any animals with them, but some some you know some folks with a stroller and what have you. And at the time, um, the O'Rourke's they were in their yard, and their puppy was in the yard. But you know, uh, eight dogs together. Could be could be totally different, so it, it's it's hard for me to uh, say to be honest with you. But um, again, those those are my observations, anyways. And were there any other questions from Mr. O'Rourke from the board? Show of hands. Nope. All right, thank you, Mr. O'Rourke. We're gonna 
promote Mr. Graziano as well now for the time being. Thank you. Is Mr. Graziano with us? I'm looking, uh, Mr. What, what's the first name? Do, do you know? Oh, I, I see it now. I, I Scott or J. Okay, I, I see an SW. I'll promote that person. Mr. Graziano, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Uh, Mr. O'Rock stated I had eight dogs. I got one that's 13 years old. All right. I have a mother and three boys and three females. All right. And I have a the English one, and the English one that's 13 years old. She's going to be getting put to sleep. So that's going to bring it down to seven. All right. And my dogs are very well mannered dogs. And when people come by the McClellan Park, they have an unleashed law. Mr. O'Rourke saying my dogs are barking viciously. No. There's some people that were, had worked for the town that come by. There was like some people that were Arlington police officers and everything that came by with this incident and they were watching my dogs. There's a lady that comes by that makes them all sit and they're all trained and they give them cookies one by one. And my dogs are very grateful. They come in at night and not out at 4.30 in the morning. Mr. O'Rourke is trying to make a remarkable thing to try to say at 4.30. They go out at the time that the ordinance is supposed to be for the dogs. I was very well aware of it from Diane when she talked to me. And... Today, I had an episode with Mr. and Mrs. O'Rourke, and we had to go straighten it out. Okay, and if you could just, first off, just state your name, just so we know who we're speaking okay. to. Okay, my name's okay. Scott Graziano. In your address? 59 Thursday Street. All right, I'll turn to the board for any questions or comments for you. Uh, Mr. Carl? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, wonder if I could ask Mr. Graziano, are, are the dogs spayed and neutered? Yes, they are. They had to. All right? They're all spayed and noodled, neutered. You know, the prior for the kennels license, they did not need to be, you know, be mating with other dogs. Okay. Um, my, uh, my next question is, um, so one of the things that we've heard is that, that um, that despite the, the fencing that the, the dogs have been able to escape yeah. um, through the garage, um, what kind of measures uh, might you be able to take to, to prevent that? And we got all new garage doors because we were going to a, a state battle with my parents when they passed away. And we had to wait till all the stuff was done because we were dealing with a family dispute on a family estate matter. So after that, we uh, told Captain Flynn that we were going to do everything to the property. We were doing everything until the estate now is over. But I had taken my brother and I had taken some money. We had done the fence. After we done the fence, there were people, there were damage to our fence because people were cutting it and letting the dogs out prior because they wanted to let the exhaust dogs escape, which was wrong, right? And we had been having an ongoing dispute. And uh, we ended up, we put brand new garage doors up and the dogs cannot get out the new garage doors because we bought, bought brand new stainless steel garage doors so that it's completely sealed and we want to be able to have the inside so we can be able to have our vehicles in there or cars and so forth. 
you know. And, and you're careful to keep them closed? Yes, we all keep them closed all times. We put brand new swinging gates, which Mr. Flynn told me it needed new gates. It came down and he liked the way it was designed. I had a buddy of mine bring down some wrap, which they used on the, which we used on Thursda Street. We used on uh, around the kennel on, so the dogs can't dig holes to get out. And the dogs we had now have been put that stuff down. Mr. Flynn was very like, like the, the power. I told him how I was doing it because I'm an, a, a designer, an ex-landscape designer. And I did all the talk, what he told me to do. And him and I agreed upon it. And I kept my promise with Mr. Flynn. And he was very happy when he saw the fence that I spent all that money for. And my understanding is, so you have seven dogs and one of them is near end of life? Pardon me? You have seven dogs now and one is near. near yes. He has near, near to be put to sleep. I hate to, but I had her since she was a puppy. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's difficult, I know. Yeah, it's um, tough when you try to get, you know, have something that you had since a puppy, you know, yeah. like a family member. Um, do, do you generally, when you let the uh, the dogs out, let all of them at once? We have a door now on the door so that we, they, 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 the dog's door, they go outside and they go to the bathroom and and the, when it's like inclement weather, I let them out because, you know, I'm not letting the dogs, you know, do their thing in the house. They run outside, use the bathroom, come running in. They go in their, their rooms and, and they have the rooms where they sleep and they don't harm anything. And, in the, and when it's raining out, they won't go outside because of the pouring rain. They don't like the inclement weather. So they go in and out on their own. Yes, sir. Um, and is, is it my understanding that two of the dogs are generally taken uh, with one of you? When you with me in my truck. I take I take Coco and the mother in the truck with me. Okay. And when the dogs got out, Mr. Rock said all eight of them came out. Shelby's too old to be running in their property. So they, with the math that they they occur to use, they need need to regen that because I there was he claims eight and I Shelby was in the house I took two so there was only four that went out the out the out in the property. That's what I heard from his testimony as well. Was four. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I, I think I have uh you know no further questions. I, I think it's probably clear uh, Mr. Graziano about the the um why, you know, I used to have German shepherds too. They they can mm -hmm. cause a lot of fear to, um, especially with young young children. So it's yeah. It's My important. dogs are not a Rottweiler. My no dogs are not pit bulls. They're hu they're husky labs. Yeah, and they're lovable. They love to play. They love children. But I wasn't home when this happened. My brother and my girlfriend's son was there. And when the incident was occurred, we have cameras. I was out in Pennsylvania when, when we had an epi two episodes, right? The episode was that Diane Welch came with the episode about the, the dogs went into her property. The second episode, I was accused for a neglect in noise allowance, well, Mrs. O'Rourke bounced a rock off my dog's head and videotaped me and turned me into the MSPCA, which was wrong. And I had a witness to that, which they were watching it on my cameras in my house. Okay. So by intimidating the dogs, videotaping and constantly I think that's intimidating my dogs, going out by the fence, jumping up and down, because I had went up to her and told her that you need to stop, you're harassing me. Her and her husband were laughing at me, 
and they took me to court today and tried to get me for a harassment charge. It didn't even get no further than, than four or five words. They could. They tried to use me as a my brother, which I was on the road. I had Attorney Fahey that helped me, and Attorney Fahey, they couldn't get a restraining order on me because they were going to use the restraining order on me to prior this uh, kennels license. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, I have no further questions. This is mine. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Graciano, um, is it you and your spouse who reside in the house, or are there other it, people? It's my girlfriend, Diane. Oh, okay. I mm. apologize. No um, and um, it sounds like both of you work during the day. My question is. Do, to me, I understand it's eight um, dogs. That one, unfortunately, um, it seems as though she's closer to the rainbow bridge, as they say, for dogs. Um, when unfortunately they they're anticipated to pass away. Is it your intention, where both of you, just the two of you and seven other dogs, that you feel you have the time to to commit to those dogs, or do you have plans to um, perhaps uh, rehome some of them? I commit to have them because they are no harm. We come home, they're very lovable. I take them out for walks. It's not like I'm neglecting them, Mrs. Milan. I, I take them, I treat them like they're my children. I, they're my, I brought them up when they were puppies. They had never had a problem when they were out here, right? When they, Problem was with Mr. O'Rourke got their dog. They were t using their dog to intimidate my dog, and we had it all on video. Okay, and then I guess my other question would be: When um, you and your girlfriend are at work, not home, where are the eight dogs? Are they outside or inside? <clears throat> two goes. Two goes with me. All right, it's Coco, okay. my chocolate one. Okay. And the mother, and the mother dog is very, very t t t calm and everything. They go in the truck with me. I leave Friday night. I mean, excuse me. I leave Monday night. I'm home Friday, and Saturday and Sunday I'm home with the dogs. And I take them outside. I give them a good brushing. I maintain them and everything. They're they're all their shots are all up to date. Everything's perfect, just that the, we were having problems with people intimidating my dogs, which, which uh, the dogs are lovable by people that come by, by McClellan's Park. They, they do have an unleashed law at certain hours. We have people that come by with their dogs running back and forth the length of my fence, Mrs. Milan, and they're not harming anybody. And then they stop and they when they stop doing it, they give my dog cookies and my cookies, they give them cookies and they run up on the stairs and they sleep. Okay, so when, when you're when you're gone Monday through Friday with Coco and his mom, the other six dogs are outside? They're or either, go, they're outside, my brother's home. Shelby, we let out, we let out, but she, she goes out and it comes in and lays down. So the other ones, they go out. If my brother's out in the hammock, they'll lay next to my brother in the hammock, and they're the calmest can be. You know, they're, they're not biters, but they love people, and the enjoyment of the people that come by, by our Trump promises, they like to have the, they see their dogs run with my dogs. And people next door were, were, very, were very upset about it, is because, uh, they were like, again, there were some people that uh, like announced to me they were only from police officers that came by with dogs. They were watching the uh, situation that was going on with my next door neighbors. And uh, there was uh, another woman that was on a um, friends of other people that I know that knew the dogs because I used to take some of the dogs and to go 
walking down the bike path together and they never had a problem. Okay, um, and here's my dilemma and um, I'm assuming Mr. Graciano that your brother is probably not on the no, call. He's right. Jay, where are you? Can you come over here, please? Mrs. Milan would like to see you. And, and what my concern is, I have um, 25 of your neighbors um, who, who have a complaint about the kennel that you have because you, you have these eight dogs. And admittedly, by um, what you've testified to, Monday through Friday, you take Coco and his mom, um, and the other six dogs are, we're not sure. I can't take from you what it is they're saying. Um, that is happening with that. And I, I guess what I'm trying to do is balance the 25 neighbors concern and perhaps any recommendations from the ACO, Diane Welch or Captain Flynn that might be there. But if you have your um, brother who lives with you or who, who stopped by one day, does he live no, at your he, home? No, he owns the house. All right, I live with my brother. Oh, I, okay. And these dogs are up with them and they never have an issue with Jay. They love Jay. And my brother Jay, believe it or not, when he goes upstairs, they, they have the, the dogs have a, a, they go up there and they, my brother has things in the floor for the dogs to lay on. And there's no problems at all. My brother's right here, if you, if you can see him on camera. My brother Jay, he, his name is Jay Graziano. Um. Can you see him, Mrs. Milan? Uh, no, I, I can see your name. I can't see you, but I can't see him. Uh, how can I click on my name? Uh, if you click oh, start on my video. Start video, correct. All right, I'm sorry. That's okay. I apologize. I probably should have asked that sooner. Yeah, I didn't even know. All right, now you can see me. Okay, is that your brother behind you? Yes, yep. that's my brother, Jay. He's my, my oldest brother. He's the only brother I have left. God bless him. And Jay, you live with Scott? Or Scott and Jay live together? Yep, we live for uh, a long time. Okay. 57 years for me, and how many years for you? How old are you? Seven. All right. We were in this neighborhood since 1946, and my dad built the house, and, and this was all farm country. Okay, and so j just real quick, Jay, um, when when Scott's away with Coco and, and Coco's mom, you're home in the house with the rest of the dogs and sort of overseeing their keep? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, I guess I'll, uh, I apologize. I didn't mean to get both of you on at the same time. Uh, no, I'll I don't know here. how this works. It's just new to us, Mrs. Milan, you know? Yeah, yeah. Good. No, God bless you. It is to me, too. So um, I guess I'll wait to hear what the rest of my colleagues have to say, um, as well as um, any uh, short-term or mid-term recommendations from Captain yeah. Flynn and ACO Welch. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Mr. Diggins? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to be um, popping back and forth between desktops here where my questions are. Uh, so um, to you, Mr. Chair, um, when you um, had the intimidation, did you report that, uh, Mr. Graziano? Intimidations on the dogs? Yeah. Yeah, the, um, I had told uh, Diane Welch with the intimidations of the dogs they were being pampered with, and uh, I was on the road. And my brother Jay was there when the MSPCA came yeah. by, and uh, her son Alan Gomo. And uh, I had a problem with Mrs. O'Rourke, and the dogs were going up. She was stamping in front of the uh, fence, and she was videotaping, and they hit a rock off of Bridget's head. Bridget was screaming and yelling. That Mr. Flynn saw me uh, take the video and uh, had take, seen me taking him in the house. I should have took it to the veterinarian, but you know, it happened so quick. I brought, got the dogs all in the house. They were intimidating the dogs. They were uh, going behind the fence and making their daughter jump in front of my dogs, which we had on the video. 
And in fact, today they tried to get a restraining order on me and, uh, and Joyce because of the matter of the stuff that was going on. And I had attorney John Fahey, Joe Fahey, which he was going to try to be on here with me, but he had some other things he had to take care of. He tried to get a restraining order on retaliation and it didn't go through. So, I see, but, but the intimidation incident was reported to Arlington police? Yes, it was. Okay. Um, so, um, so um, did, the, did the puppies have any training? You know, were they ever trained? Yes, they, when they were puppies, we were having them sit. They were uh, give them a, or giving them a cookie when they would do orders and they, they sit down, they lay down. And if anybody comes near the house, inside the house, he comes up to the house, they would bark, let us know if we were like downstairs doing laundry and everything. And they would go up to the window. they no harm or nothing. They don't, they're not packs of wolves. They're not things like that, where the people are trying to, to word them. They're lovable dogs. I take, some time, I take sometimes one of each, but we take the mother dog because the mother dog is always begging us and, and everything to take us. So we take Coco and stuff. I have a, they're good dogs, sir. They never had a pro issue, but Today, they, today it really hurt me when they turn around and use my brother's name in the courthouse to try to say I was the one that was with Diane Welch, which I wasn't, and we had that matter resolved today. Yeah. Um, so, do you think the dogs can be trained uh, to be quieter? Yes, they can. They can be. They, you tell them to lay down. They lay down. Tell them to uh, come in. We do not let the dogs stay out after seven because I know there's uh, two neighbors on the street. They let their dogs out after hours. I had um, gone to go out to the store. A dog had, uh, was on a driveway. And when I came out, it, I scared him. He was barking and growling at me. I... Uh, was feared that I was going to get bit. I didn't know whose dog it was, but when my dog saw it in the house, they were barking and the dog ran. Okay. Um, so just um, one more question. This is actually on through you, Mr. Chair, to um, mm -hmm. the Com council. Um, what's the limit on the number of dogs that someone can have in a kennel? This is just a curiosity question about the, the bylaw itself. I mean, so we know that um, more than four triggers the kennel, private kennel. What's the maximum people can have? Uh, Mr. Chair, may I? So, Mr. Diggins, um, I don't actually see a, a maximum outlined in the personal kennel bylaw in terms of a cap. Right. Um, there, there, okay. There may be one at state law um, where there yeah. may be a point in time in which they can't, you know, uh, adequately uh, house the dogs under right. some other rules and regulations that we have, but right. I don't actually see the next one. I hear you. All right. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Corsi? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening, Mr. Graziano. Good morning. Good evening, Mr. Steve. Oh, hi, Steve. Good, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. So I, just a, a, a few questions, yeah. and I'm going to put aside the issues that you have with the O'Rourke's right now, but Mm -hmm. As Mrs. Mahan said, that there's 23 other neighbors who have signed a petition alleging that there's been excessive barking. And what you said earlier this evening is, that, you know, while your dogs are out, they, they may not be barking. I mean, do you, a, 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 and, and this is what we're going to have to grapple with and what, if we refer this out for further investigation. Um, so I just want to be clear, yeah. when the dogs are out and someone walks by, whether it's on Thesda Street, or behind the property at McLennan um, Park, do do the bark at them. Your dogs. My when they they come up when they come up to the McClellan's Park, 
We have four people that come up every day. They take their dog. They they have that leash. They take, they take, what's that law? They take the they take the dogs off the leash and let the dogs run in McClellan Park at certain hours. Correct. And uh, yeah, am I correct, Steve? I, I yeah, I don't know what the restrictions are up there. Right, well, there is. They, people, people that take they, dogs off leashes. Yeah, in they some take parts them off. Sometimes. You've been in my backyard, Steve, so you know the, the, the town fence in the back, right? Yeah. My dog goes up there, they run back and forth, all right? They get tired out. They come back inside the house, and they sleep. And we close the door, so they would we take a nap or whatever. I didn't want to have an issue if we fell asleep, whatever. They, they stay in the house. When I go outside, I take dogs out with me. They walk around the yard with me. They lay out in the sun on the ground and don't have an issue. I, when they people see the couple people know my dog's name, they, they yell for their names, they come run into the fence, they give them cookies. I don't have an issue with that because I know them, but I get kind of wary sometimes. Time is like Diane had said to me, be careful who you let people give cookies to because you don't know what they're going to be giving to the dog. Right, right. He, he, okay, so so here's my concern, and, and you've laid out what, what you see from your dogs when you're mm -hmm. at home. And again, we've only heard testimony from, from Mr. O'Rourke, but, but we do have the written document, and it, it appears that there's a number of people that, that say that your dogs are excessively barking. And I'm going to put aside the issue with the fencing because it seems like you've you've right. addressed that. I but have a... if, if yeah, let me just finish for a second. So if you and and from my perspective, if someone's walking by your home and every time someone walks by, the dogs come up to the fence and are barking, that that's excessive barking. And I think you know, and you you may agree with that. Um, and it's a question maybe whether there is excessive barking. And you installed video cameras. My understanding, there's no sound with those video cameras. No, right? by law, you cannot have sound because yeah. it's against right. the law. Right. Okay. All right. So you just have video. How long does your video, does it record video or is it just replay every 24 hours? Was it, Jay? Yeah. What's that video of cameras? Is it every hour or every 24 hours? Every 24, it records? Hours. Every 24 hours, Steve, it records. Okay. And where, where does it where does it record? Where Where is it? Is it... Just in your backyard, or is it the, on the side the of the house? Front of, front of the house, the side of the house, all and way. all four ways. Okay. All right. Um, well, I mean, we depending I on what we do question. here, we may we may ask to take a look at that. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think at this point we've got a difference of you know we we heard from you, Mr. Graziano. We heard from the O'Rourke's. We have the written petition. It seems to me that. We've got to do do a little bit more, uh, to, maybe to hear from some of the neighbors to see what their perception is. Because I got a question. We, so. We've got two people coming in and two different views as to what's going on at the properties. I have a question for you, sir. Sure. Why are these petitions? Some of these people are like way over on the other side of town that don't even exist around the area that don't even hear my thoughts. I, it's like people down on Forest Street, there's people on Magnolia Street, uh, Upping Street that are not even near my neighborhood on this condition. I'm just looking at the list now, and I see, well, there's at least 14 people on Thesda Street, and then yeah. there are other, there's a Summer Street location, Wright Street is nearby, mm -hmm. um, and Westmoreland, Heard, and, and Forest Street, you're right, there, yeah. there are some other streets. Yeah, the, the uh, okay. West Mall, and that's the way across town. What they, you know, that's you know, that's what are over by the reservoir, correct? So Mr. Graziano, the bylaw allows that. So at this time, it's not really appropriate to talk about, you know, that portion of the mm -hmm. bylaw since the bylaw just requires um, residents. Yeah, um, that, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Graziano. Yeah. All right, and Mr. Graziano, just one question that. Mrs. Mahan had touched on, and sorry if the answer was clear, it wasn't clear to me, but you had said that you're away from Monday to Friday. Is there a time when your dogs are in the backyard when no one is at the house? Uh, 
But no one's in a, in a boat with you, meaning family? No, no one that lives in your house or that takes care of your dogs is. Uh, the dogs go in when we go, when we go out. We do not leave the dogs out when we leave the, leave the premises. Come all the, the dogs be inside the house. Yes. Unless someone, yes. either you, your girlfriend, or your brother was at the house. My brother would be the one. If my brother has to go to doctor's appointments, John, dogs stay in the house. All right. If no one isn't around, the dogs are in the house. If, uh, say, like my girlfriend and son, or, or it's here. He'd be outside with the dog, sit on the porch, watch him move, you know, be out on the porch. And then when he comes in, he calls them all in because if he wants to go take off down to his friend's house, oh, the dogs just are inside the house. Okay, okay. I think don't leave them out when uh, no one's home. Trust me. Your, your answer was, was clear. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right, so Mr. Chap so Mr. Graziano, thank you for, uh, unless anyone from the board has any further questions by show of hands. Thank you for, um, yeah, Mr. Carroll. Okay, thank you, John. I just wanna clarify that last question, uh, Mr. Chair. Yep. So Mr. Graziano, you said that the dogs are called in, but you had said there's a dog door they can go in and out of. Is the yeah, dog- Yeah, but we lock, lock the door. Lock the door, lock the door okay. Joe. All That's right. what I we don't leave the door open. We 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 lock the door. Only time we're we're home, we let the dogs go in and out of uh, their dog door. Okay, thank you. All right, all right. Thank you, Mr. Graziano. Um, we're gonna put you back down with the rest of the uh, attendees, and then we'll have a discussion amongst the board. Okay. All right. So I'll turn to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. Mr. Carroll. I gotta be honest. This this is one of the most difficult things I've dealt with on eight and a half years on the board <laughs> to cut through. Um, you know, my my understanding, if we could clarify through Captain Flynn, was that there were some there were measures that were uh, prescribed to Mr. Graziano to control the situation. Work is underway, but there was actually a deadline of October thirtieth given to. Um, to, to, to comply, um, is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Carroll. Uh, and, and again, those are uh, corrective measures for the property itself and uh, you know, for the security of the property to make sure the property is secure and that the property is safe. Um, kind of a whole other issue is, is the dog barking issue and, uh, and what have you, again, um, I was at the property today. There were three dogs on the property today. It, it wasn't an issue, but you know, six or eight dogs is different than three dogs at times. And, and um, the removal of, the, the, of a solid fence and a chain link fence being put up, now you've created a little less of a barrier between. So the dogs know when there's another dog in the other yard. Um, I think they've done a pretty good job, uh, not only with the fence, but putting up a barrier within the fence, the slats that they put up in the fence. But again, there's, there's going to be times where the dogs know there's something on the other side of the fence and they're going to, you know, that's how they communicate. They're going to bark and, and, and do what they do. Now there's training. There's, there are other things that I, I think could happen. Um, but you're still talking about seven dogs. And even if you pull the license, I think you're talking about four dogs being in a backyard right smack in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Um, no question they care about the dogs and and what have you, but I think they could probably take some more measures in regards to keeping the dogs more quiet. It seems like that's that's really gonna be the next obstacle. So I, I guess I would, um, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, and ask town council, I, I know you went through some of what we could do um, as actions, but I think I need some reiteration. Are we, in a position to um, order certain conditions uh, for, for maintaining the kennel license? So Mr. Kiro, at so set forth in the bylaw, at this hearing, the select board, quote, may cause an investigation of the kennel that is subject of the petition or take such other action as it deems prudent. So I think the board can certainly 
um, you know, take action relative to the license. It can uh, cause further investigation in terms of, you know, the information that you've heard tonight, uh, whether you feel like it would be helpful to understand more about how the situation uh, proceeds. Um, you know, if you want further information from the animal control officer, from Captain Flynn, um, from the health department, anybody that you want, you're entitled to get more information. You don't have to make a decision tonight. If you're inclined to make a decision tonight, that language or of or take such other action as it deems prudent is uh, pretty broad. After the hearing and any investigation um, or further proceedings, you don't have to wrap the, the hearing up tonight. You could continue it. Again, you can suspend or revoke the license um, or take other action to quote, regulate the kennel uh, that you deem prudent, or you can dismiss the petition. So um, that's, that's, you've got a pretty broad range of options available mm -hmm. to you. And I know sometimes that makes life harder than easier. But that's, yeah, that's it sure does. Um, yeah. Because where I'm, where I'm at right now, um, you know, as far as the physical rest restraints for the, for the property, it sounds like a lot of action has been taken there and that it may be worthwhile to, um, you know, to see, see how that, that, that plays out. If, if those actions have been effective, I mean, clearly there's been investment in the fencing and visible screening and, and the items underneath. So what that leaves us with is, is the noise. And I couldn't tell you how, how uh, you can effectively control that um, be, beyond what's being, um, you know, represented to us that the dogs aren't left un, unattended in the, in the backyard. Other than um, I think uh, Mr. Diggins raised the, the question as to whether um, there is any type of training that, that could be employed. And uh, what I heard in the answer was that it, it wasn't a formal training program. And so I think my inclination on this is to refer this back to APD and the animal control officer to um, you know, work with the Grazianos on on a um, a, a plan of of uh, you know humane training or other me measures that might be employed to to uh, attempt to control the barking. That that's 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 that seems to me to be the the um, next logical step of what we're really trying to do is 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 address trying to address the danger of the dogs getting out. Sounds like that's, that's underway. And, and Captain Flynn, it sounds like you're, you're on that. Um, but, but um, the, the, the noise issue is, is one that's, uh, I, I'm not a dog trainer. I, uh, um, I just keep my dog inside because <laughs> she's barking. Um, so it's, it seems like we, we should be looking to some of the expertise we have on staff with uh, uh, animal control officer Walsh. So that'd be my motion. I know it's a little muddy, but um, uh, you know, my motion would be to refer it back to APD and the animal control officer to um, work with the Grazianos on, on a um, concrete steps that, that could be taken in, in the form of training or other humane measures that, that might c control the, um, the barking problem. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could second that and yes. very short comment. Yep. Um, the, the petition from the citizens position, a petition um, from 25, 26 people uh, speak to the noise complaints and barking issues um, and an unreasonable event of barking. It, it doesn't say anything beyond that. So if, if um, I'd like to second Mr. Carroll's motion and with Mr. Carroll and Captain Flynn's guidance, whether it should be a three or six month um, report back, uh, whether it should be January or April, um, in terms of when this is brought before the board again, or if Mr. Carroll just wants to leave it open-ended, that Captain Flynn will, will let us know when this should come back on the agenda. But I will second Mr. Carroll's motion. Mr. Carroll. Mr. Chair, well, I guess my answer to that would be, I, I, I don't know how long it takes to teach an old dog new tricks. No. So uh, <laughs> I'd have to, um, 
That, that's one where I think I, I, I might have to defer to the recommendation of the uh, ACO as well. I mean, I would hope that, that within, within three to six months that this, this could be resolved. I'm going to assume that as the weather gets colder, that the, these dogs won't be out as much. Yeah. And, and if I could ask Captain Flynn whether three or six months um, might be the appropriate time to revisit this, if he feels he can opine on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. I, I, I think that would be fair. Um, again, I, I would agree with Mr. Kira, though. We're going we're gonna to run into some colder weather soon, and um, <coughs> if what Mr. Graziano is telling us about the dogs not liking to be outside and inclement weather and whatnot, the dogs are going to be inside probably more than they're outside now, and they're generally going to be quieter. So um, I don't know where this will kind of rear its head again in the springtime, but uh, I am... I have, I would agree. I think, I think that's a plan. I would have a conversation with the ACO and see what kind of steps can be taken in regards to training and, and what maybe other communities have done um, with these kind of problems and, uh, and try and put some sort of a plan together and then revisit this and whatever you think is fair, three to six months is, it sounds fair. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, may I? Yep. I just want to make sure that I understand the motion by Mr. Kuro and Mrs. Mahan. Um, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like the determination of this body, if the motion were successful, would be that the kennel license is conditioned upon, basically the finding of the board is that the maintenance of this kennel license is conditioned on satisfactory um, you know, completion of a training program uh, as recommended by the animal control officer um, or APD. Um, rather than referring this for investigation and keeping this hearing process open. Is that correct? Mr. Carroll? Uh, um, well, firstly, I think I noted that it's, just, it's, it's training or other humane measures to control barking as may be recommended by the, by the animal control officer. That, that's for starters. Um, I, I guess it probably makes sense for us to get a report back in six months uh, from from the the uh, ACL. What be it be it in, in this format or or a, a written report? Um, I think that that probably makes the most sense to try to close the loop on this. The only piece that I I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yes. The only piece that I would just want to be clear on, I guess, is that. The board's, again, options are to refer this for investigation, which would essentially keep this hearing process open until some further date when you would be satisfied or not satisfied by some further information. The other option, if you're going to basically place a regulation on the license, requires a determination to be issued to the uh, license holder so that they have can exercise whatever the rights that they have pursuant to a decision. And it's just important to sort of procedurally differentiate between those, those two things so that we know uh, and the board office knows how to treat the, the, the license itself. So j just so I'm clear, through you, Mr. Chair, so I'm clear, if we issue the condition, we potentially close this hearing, but the condition is now attached to license. If the condition is not met, then there's a new process to revoke the license? That's right. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, if I may, that's correct. Yeah. That you basically be putting a further regulation on the license um, as the decision of this body. But if instead what you're saying, and I'm not, I'm, trying, I'm not trying to put words in anybody's mouth, if instead what you're saying is, we feel like we need more information to figure out how we want to handle this particular petition, that's fine. I just want to be clear that the, that that's a, a different posture. If I can just jump in, I think what we're trying, the tenor of the motion is, and I think what we're trying to look for is that we let the investigation go on. We ask for a six month investigation, we're referring to the APD for a six month investigation. During that time, mm -hmm. the ACO will work with the resident, suggest certain measures that could be taken to reduce the noise complaints and then report back the, the at the end of the investigation in three to six months however 
long that the ACO determines, and then we'll make a final determination on this petition. Okay. okay, Mr. Chair, if I could uh, make a motion to uh, refer for investigation with a preliminary um, report back at the three month mark and a final report back at the six month mark. With the other conditions that I put on? Yeah, yes, Mr. Carroll, I apologize, okay. yes. Okay. Mr. Carroll, do you want to withdraw your motion second Ms. Bond's motion? Absolutely. Okay. All right, Mrs. DeCourcy, any additional comments? Yeah, no, no, I can't agree with that. I saw Captain Flynn raise his hand. I don't know if he wanted to say something Captain Flynn? in response to that motion. I just want you to be comfortable with what we're doing. No, oh, absolutely, Mr. Chair. Yes, and I agree and would suggest that we, you know, we can provide, we'll be able to track calls for service in that neighborhood and any complaints that we receive in regards to the dog. And um, we'll be prepared to put something together preliminary in three months and in six months have a final uh, report for the board. And Mr. Dickens? Yeah. Sorry. Hold on. Oh, yeah, there we go. Sorry, I had, still was muted. Um, yeah, I, mean, I like the idea. Uh, I do have a question for Captain Flynn through to you. Um, uh, are there dogs in the neighborhood? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, there are other animals in the neighborhood. Do, and do they animals and our animals just on the other side of the back fence in McLennan Park? Do they bark? The other animals? Yes. I would imagine so. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. um, and um, my other um, comment is that I, I, I'm a little concerned about the three months and six months time frame because, because as mentioned, I mean, we are going to winter. And so I'm afraid we might get like a false positive on results. I mean, if we assess in three months, I mean, we'll probably definitely get a false positive. Uh, and, or let's, let me rephrase that misleading. We might be misled into thinking that um, the situation has been um, made better. Um, and so I, I would suggest a, a um, adjusting the time frame and generalizing this issue a little bit more. Uh, I will just say that if anyone played music like dogs bark, me, people would make noise complaints about it. I mean, me played music at that volume in the times of day that we hear even one dog barking, me, there would be complaints issued and people go, you know what, that's not cool. I mean, uh, you're, 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 you're making too much noise. I mean, so I think in general, I mean, uh, the whole I mean, like noise thing has got to be dealt with because it does drive people crazy. I mean, and, and by that crazy, I mean, I think it makes them really behave negatively towards their neighbors. I mean, um, and small things become big things because people have just been assaulted by the noise for a long time. It's a bigger issue, but this one reason that I feel that we really need to go at the root of really trying to deal with this noise issue for the 25 people that have complained. And maybe for the other people who are not complaining about the people who own one dog that's barking at whatever time. So that's it, thank you. Thank you. And I also will support the motion. I just note to Captain Flynn, this is a thought that the investigation would be both what happens to the noise complaint, but as you report back, we'd also be interested to hear if there were any basis to some of the allegations from the residents about, you know, other neighbors, not particularly O'Rourke's or any other neighbors that are doing anything that exacerbate the situation with his dogs. So just as a point of comment. Um, so with that, Attorney Hyman, we have a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Carl. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Thank you, Captain Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everyone. All right, that takes us on to traffic rules and order and other business. We have item number five on our agenda, request for one space on street overnight parking at 43 Thorndike Street by Mr. Matt O'Connor. And we do have a recommendation here in our file that's been posted from our parking control officer, Officer Rateau. So is Mr. O'Connor with us? 
He is. I just promoted him to panelist. Mr. O'Connor, can you hear us? Yes. Good evening. Thank you, board members, uh, for having me. Can you your name and address and then just tell us a little bit about your petition? Sure. My name is Matt O'Connor. I live at 43 Thorndike Street with my wife, Susie, and my son, Franklin. Um, we moved here in July, bought a house in July, came coming back to Arlington. Both my parents are from here. Uh, my dad on Peter Tufts Road and my mom on North Union Street, uh, Fred O'Connor, Gene Aiken. So we were super excited to come back. Um, buying a house during a pandemic is uh, less than ideal, but uh, we were excited coming from Cambridge from 800 square feet to finally find a single family home uh, just across 16. Uh, it was exciting. The house had a driveway. Uh, we have two cars and we figured, you know, we got to see the house for 15 minute walkthrough uh, and online and it was pretty much closed in three days. Um, we figured the driveway would certainly accommodate both our cars. My wife and I both work uh, full time. Um, upon moving in, uh, we quickly realized that it couldn't accommodate two cars. I've even uh, tested it by pulling both cars in during a storm and I had a crawl out the tailgate to my forester and call my wife to come open it for me because the problem is the driveway isn't wide enough. Uh, it abuts the house and it abuts our neighbor's property. We were also unaware of the overnight parking ban. Uh, that was something uh, I was completely unaware of. So when I did get one of my first tickets, uh, I was a little surprised and uh, I'm pretty proactive and very big into communication. So I called the town uh, and the police morning of and uh, was let in on how it all works and that Thorndike is a pretty active street uh, due, to, due to its proximity to uh, Alewife. Um, we, uh, you know, we, as I mentioned, we do need both of our cars for work. We have a son who has a uh, complicated medical history, actually has some surgery tomorrow morning. Um, we do park our car in front of our house. And um, I will say, I fully understand how that, you know, there are other cars on the street that do that as well. And I know there is a, a ban on overnight parking. Um, and I guess whether it's now or at the end, I'd have to ask, I've read through the website, the town website, and I can't find, and maybe I overlooked it, why there's an overnight parking ban for residents um, and what the reason is. Um, when I've gotten my tickets, I've looked out in the morning, and there's plenty of cars that I know are residents of my street. Uh, and they, the cars are in the same place 24 hours a day um, and either they haven't been ticketed either or they're parked in front of their house. Um, and, they, and they have been ticketed too. There's others that have been ticketed and they're parked in front of their house. So, um, I mean, that's the situation we're going through. We've explored, I've talked to friends and family and they're like, well, why can't you just ex extend the driveway? Extending the driveway is not an issue, extending it. The issue is width and again, it's unfortunate um, and I've tested it just because I wanted to be sure. I wanted to, you know, check everything. It's just, it's, you can't get out of the car in the doors. Like if my wife is getting the car, we back out to get her in. Uh, but if we put both cars in, the car at the very end can get in, but the other one is basically landlocked. Um, so having that car on the street currently uh, sort of enables us to be get to both and do whatever we need to do for work and for our son. Um, All right, Mr. O'Connor, at this point, I'm gonna to turn to the board for sure. any questions or comments that they might have. Uh, Mr. Corsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, Mr. O'Connor. I just, I didn't realize until you said um, during the introduction, but your mother and my mother and Mrs. Kropalko were all classmates at Arlington High School. So, uh, that's um, funny you say that, Mr. Corsi. I, I know your mother, uh, Anne-Marie, very well. Um, I haven't seen her in a long time. And my mother didn't inform me because my original email went to uh, Ms. Kropelka and my mother was like, oh, I went to high school with her. So yes, um, yeah, that is correct. And, and, and I wish your son the best of luck in his, in, in his surgery Thank you. tomorrow. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, and, 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 you know, th this is, I've, I've only been on the board for a year and a half. I've had one other of these hearings. These are very different hearings because un unfortunately we have, um, very strict standards for, for the hardship for, for um, off-street parking. And um, you raise a good question as to, you know, whether we continue with the um, overnight parking ban or not. And then from time to time, we talk about looking, looking into that. Um, 
I, I'm, unfortunately, and I'll, I'll wait for the other members of the board. I, I, I've been by your house. I, I do see the problem that you have with the, the width of the driveway as you, as you go, if you were to go deeper, if the driveway extended, the house extends, so you, you can't park a car there. Um, my other colleagues who've been on the board longer, um, I think will point out that where there is a parking spot available on a property, usually there's not a, a hardship waiver given, but I want to let them give them the opportunity to speak. And um, I think it's unfortunate where there's only one car that can fit in, but it, it's our standards that we've applied in the past make it very difficult for us to grant the waiver. But um, I want to hear what the others have to say before we take a final vote. Thank you. And Mr. Diggins? Well, I haven't been on the board very long, but I've watched a lot of these meetings and, and I know how these um, requests go, and, um, especially when and, um, a, the reporting officer I mean, does not um, approve it, as is in the case here. I mean, uh, a, the reason these um, bans exist is because we have had uh, at least a couple of um, town-wide uh, referendum uh and ballots I mean and this passed overwhelmingly that people do not want on street parking uh, and in the east i mean it's pretty dense I mean and i'm thinking that if we did allow uh for it what would we do uh, with the demand I mean for that on street parking very soon we'd have I mean a shortage of it and we'd have to regulate it in some way it uh um it it I guess my question is, and to my colleagues too, is that I mean, at what level of um, health, I mean, or concerns about someone's health, I mean, does it warrant an exempt an exemption? And I'll make the situation be even a little tougher on us. Is that normally, I mean, as you know, I'm a transit guy, and uh, but uh, given the pandemic, I mean, uh, we realize that people are not I mean, doing transit as much I mean for a variety of reasons I mean so we can see people I mean, maybe gravitating towards their cars more I mean one of the solutions which is probably not applicable in your situation right now is smaller cars I mean, uh, I, mean I see these little smart cars that can fit in the um in a bike lane essentially I mean if you had a couple of those you could probably fit them in your place I mean that might be a longer term solution uh but but I mean I'm not going to close the door now uh because I want to hear what other people say because you know, I would like to get to yes, but get to yes in a way that is is consistent. I mean that it can apply to someone other than you, and it can apply town wide and in a way that uh, makes sense. I mean, and you know, that's it. I'll stop. Mrs. Mahan, I'm um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I understand the petitioner, um, and it his mom or parents lived here before, which anyone who's lived in Arlington any extended amount of time knows that there is no parking overnight um, on our residential streets. And that's something that's been put forth the town meeting and the voters at least three times in the past 20 years. Um, and it just hasn't gone through. So um, uh, with that, um, and I understand family circumstances. I, I certainly have all my colleagues know on the board, my personal circumstances, which don't play into anything, but that um, I would make a motion from um, the recommendation from our traffic and parking unit that we um, move no action on granting a waiver in front of 43 Thor Thorndike Street, but that we do recommend that either the Hattie School or any other municipal parking lot nearby that the petitioner um, look into that for some relief. Mr. Carl? Yeah, I'll second the motion and just say the, these are always uh, difficult. I think you ask a great question, why do we have the overnight parking ban? And I think if you ask folks, you'll get a lot of different, um, it's been around for so long, you'll get a lot of different uh, responses. I mean, there's some thinking that um, that it increases public safety by, by um, removing visible barriers to properties at night. Um, some thinking that it was put in place originally to uh, keep down traffic um, or, or density of households. 
I've asked this question many times. I think a lot of us have gotten different different answers through the years, but um, you know what Ms. Mahan and um, and others have said is, is is right. I think that uh, shortly after I got on the board, eight and a half years ago, <clears throat> we, we had a thought that we would go to the voters again uh, because we, we thought maybe we would be able to do some experimentation with the overnight overnight parking. Every single precinct voted to uphold um, voted to uphold uh, the the overnight parking ban. So um, we've been very hesitate hesitant to um to to um uh you know break with the uh the, the will of the voters uh in in that and it's, it's actually it's not really good public policy for us to be offering um you know one-off um I exceptions i think we'd rather be able to do that in a uh a more comprehensive uh way and we we, we do some of that with um uh for you know, in, when a, a uh, driver with a handicap placard or whatnot, we we have made some exceptions there. But um, so I, I've second Ms. Mahan's motion. I'm sorry. I know that it's a it's um, it's a big inconvenience, but it's uh, it's it's uh, it's where we are. So, thank you. I would just add that we had probably a year to year and a half ago we had a number of discussions around the overnight parking ban and some creative solutions that have been put forth and since the pandemic we kind of sidelined those discussions and i anticipate in the coming years we will resume those discussions but as of right now we do have the parking ban and what we had discussed about a year ago is putting in sort of a checklist system every time we get a request from someone for an overnight parking uh, permit. And the first item on the parking permit is, do you have parking? Not, do you have two, three spots? It's, does the unit have parking? And if you check that box, then we go no further. And we, we generally, in those situations don't, that's not an exigent situation where we, we um we grant these situations um you know i think the one shining light that you have is it's inconvenient but i had a house with no parking when i first lived in arlington and we parked over the pier school it's a little bit of a walk but you do have a, a few options nearby that can you know in certain circumstances you can get overnight parking in the municipal lots that will alleviate the situation for you. It won't grant you the relief that, that you guys are looking for. But like I said, you know, the first question we ask in these situations is, is there parking at the property? And for you, there is one spot available. Um, so thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Um, I'm gonna ask, does the, board, does the board have any further questions for Mr. O'Connor? All right, we're gonna discuss it and take a vote. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. All right, and Mr. DeCourcy, any further discussion on this? Uh, no further discussion. Mr. Dickens, any further discussion? No, no, it's just, yeah, no, not now. Mr. Mahan? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Carroll? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, Attorney Hahn, we have a recommended vote of no action by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Carl. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Carroll? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. All right, that takes us to our next item, number 600, agenda discussion and approval, CDBG. CV3 program activities recommended by the CDBG subcommittee. Mr. Chaplin. Yes, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, so last week, the CDBG subcommittee met. Uh, Arlington Fortunate as an entitled com uh, entitlement community has received an additional $320,485 uh, in supplemental CDBG monies to help provide uh, relief uh, in these times that we're facing. So the committee reviewed recommendations that were made by staff from the Planning and Community Development Department. 
uh, gave some feedback and those recommendations were slightly tweaked and brought before the board tonight. Uh, we had initially envisioned meeting again with the CDBG subcommittee before coming to the board. But what we learned through that subcommittee meeting was the faster we can ask for approval from this board, the faster we can start the process with the federal government, with HUD, to then be able to put these dollars into the hands of the people that we want to get them to based on their demonstrated need. So from these $320,000, we're recommending that we put 200,000 towards a further business assistance program and $120,485 towards public services. The business assist, uh, assistance program, uh, as is laid out in the memo, uh, envisions potentially giving grants uh, up, up to 20 businesses or two 20 businesses uh, in the amounts of $10,000, but we ask that the board also accept there being some flexibility in making grant amounts uh, higher or lower than that $10,000 threshold. Uh, we wanna make sure through feedback from the business community that we're giving grants that can truly keep businesses afloat um, as we want the program to be as successful as possible. In terms of public services, uh, these dollars we're asking be equally split between the school department and health and human services. So we're asking that uh, uh, just approximately $60,000 go to the schools to provide uh, for uh, tutoring services to students that are, are demonstrating challenges with remote and online learning. And that $60,000 go to Health and Human Services for the creation of a test an on-site testing center at Monotomy Manor for tenants for te testing for COVID-19. So we're asking for favorable action from the board tonight, which will then start uh, a five-day public comment period and then lead to the rest of the uh, process with HUD Again, hoping to make these dollars uh, available before the end of the calendar year. So I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that the board has, but we're looking for a vote of approval tonight. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know if you would like to make your remarks before mine, because I don't want to take everything away before you do, or how do you want to oh, handle that? Everything that um, Mr. Chapdelaine said, uh, th there was discussion about basically the CDBG subcommittee, Mr. Hurd and I and, and the rest of the members would like a vote tonight so that these monies would be available in December. Anything later than that would push the process to January. Um, I would um, inform people that I know when people hear CDBG, they, they want to get projects in. This is two, two very limited um, areas that these monies can go to, but we will be starting in December, opening the quote unquote regular CDBG uh, application process for what we normally do every year. And we also anticipate under the CDBG CARES Act, CV3, et cetera, that there might be two, two two other allocations under this. So um, I, I would just echo everything uh, that the town manager said, as well as um, there were two businesses that initially applied to the CDBG CARES Act that were not allowed, did not fit the criteria. I would encourage them and anyone else to apply for this. So um, with that, I would, um, make a motion to uh, approve the CDBG CV3 program activities recommended by our CDBG subcommittee. Yep. And I just add that we're all in unanimous agreement as to the recommendations with the subcommittee. And I do wanna give credit where credit's due because as the meeting was going, like many town meetings, we were gonna table it to the next meeting, get a final recommendation, make a vote for at another CDBG meet, subcommittee meeting. But I wanna give credit to Mrs. Mahan who stepped up and said, hey, you know, this is for businesses that really need the, the money right now. And as that, we took the, we took the recommendations from the planning department, made some slight modifications and got this on this agenda, which, which was quick, but really needed. So I, I did wanna give Ms. Mahan credit for that. And if I could jump in on that, um, our chair does serve on the um, planning 
and Community Development uh, Economic Task Force. I'm not going to say that um, misnomer right, but um, that's part of the reason that kind of spurred me on because um, you have been very active on that committee and I've kept myself and the rest of my colleagues abreast in terms of economic, uh, economic development and, and trying to keep our businesses vital. So sure. back at you, my friend, and thank, thank you so much. All right, Mr. Corsi. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Cherry. It was Mr. Curl, Mr. Diggins and I will have to work on something else together, but uh, I appreciate the work that you're, um, that, that you both did. And I, I think it makes good sense. I, I'm, I'm glad that this is on the agenda tonight because um, we, you know, the sooner we can get the money out, the, the, the better off and the more help that we can give biz, businesses and individuals. So thank you. Um, and if, if, I, I guess that was your motion, Dan. I'll say, I'll, I'll second the motion. You, Mr. Carroll. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate the work on this as well. Um, I, my only question is, um, is there, are there any criteria that you anticipate beyond the um, number of employees? Uh, for example, I'm thinking of the, um, the PPP loan grant program was specifically directed towards maintaining payroll or meeting utilities or, or, or whatnot. It, do you anticipate criteria like that or, or is it strictly um, you know, Arlington-based businesses that, that uh, have a maximum of 20 FTEs? Let Mr. Chapdelaine answer, but I think it's just the number of employees is set by HUD, but they, it's just a general grant. But Mr. Chapdelaine, yeah, I thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, in general terms, Mr. Mr. Hurd is correct. Um, there, there's a series of eligible costs that go beyond payroll, uh, but not all costs. Uh, and planning staff will work with each grant applicant to make sure that what they spend the money on is eligible under HUD. Oh, so there is an accounting Correct. feedback. So great. Uh, thank you very much for your work on this. I'm happy to support the motion. Mr. Dickens? Yes. Well, well, I, I actually attended the last um, Arlington Economic Recovery um, Task Force um, meeting. And so I got to see a little a bit of this coming. And um, I have a, a, I mean, I do support it, you know, a lot. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions. Be one about the money to businesses. Be uh, will they be able to use this money to uh, to get things before? Um, I think one with one of the other programs. I mean, they had to like, for instance, buy um, inventory, we and then get reimbursed for it. And so, for some of those businesses, that was that was difficult because they didn't have the money to buy the inventory. And so, is that a situation like? Is 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 a situation similar for this grant? So, Mr. Chair, may I respond? Um, I I believe all of these CDBG programs are reimbursement based, so I, yeah. I do believe that the expense has to be um, expended and demonstrated before reimbursement can be received. Right, I, right. I'm ninety eight percent sure of that, Mr. Diggins. I could confirm the planning staff, but I, I'm I'm fairly certain it is reimbursement based. Okay, and the reason I asked that though is because when there was discussion about it, and it could be that I'm getting programs confused. I mean, there was one. The question was, hey, do we come up with something that will help a few businesses a lot? I mean, or whether we come up with something that will help a lot of businesses a little? And that's even though that's the way it was said. I think the thought was, I mean, let's say we wanted to help businesses, we come up with some. Uh, better way to use technology in websites, for instance. I mean, then do we, we come up, hire someone he, that helps a whole bunch of businesses with their websites or with their technology? I mean, uh, so that's the reason I thought it might have been a little different than a reimbursement program. I mean, well, as I said, I mean, I think the reimbursement programs are kind of problematic, I mean, but I mean, I'm still going to support this, but just put that out there. Uh, and I certainly like what's going on with the, with the plan for the school, especially hiring a tutor. I mean, I really like what's about the plan for um, um, the, the um, other aspect of it where you help people with food um, and other humanitarian um, needs. I mean, so, so I'm glad we got the money. I'm glad we're pushing forward sooner rather than later. So total support. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Jenny Heim, we have a... Motion for approval by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. 
Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Curo? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's unanimous vote. All right, thank you. And that takes us on to, so we have item number seven. Um, as I mentioned before, this was, I believe, so be on for a uh, more of a motion for receipt. Which, so moved. Yeah, um, we have a motion to receive correspondence. From second. Mr. Carl, second by Mr. Mahan. Do see any questions? Mr. Diggins? Um, I'll save it for later, thank you. All right, Attorney Han. Mrs. Mohan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. All right, that brings us to number eight on our agenda. Discussion and approval, reinstatement of parking meters on November 1st. Mr. Chaplain. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. So tonight, um, I wanted to ask the board, we've been talking about this uh, all through the summer uh, I feel like almost every month we've thought about coming back and asking to turn the meters on. Um, but one major thing we wanted to do was get pay by phone up and running before we came back and also have there be more demonstrated uh, business occurring or, or commerce occurring in the center before we turn the meters on. Um, with with traffic uh, picking up and with the, the good news that I know Mr. Kira will very much appreciate with pay by phone ready to be implemented uh, at the start of November, we do want to ask the board tonight to turn the meters back on or to begin enforcing the meters again uh, at the start of November on both the street as well as in the Russell Common lot and the railroad lot. Uh, on the agenda, I asked for the board to consider uh, initiating this on November 1st. It was very uh, wisely pointed out to me that waiting to turn them back on until after election day would make a lot of sense. And also in the same motion or same request, to request um, suspending metering in the lots, the, uh, the Russell Common lot and the railroad lot, the last Saturday in November and the first three Saturdays in December, uh, which is the norm, uh, the normal request made by the Chamber of Commerce to support business through the holiday season. So if the board would entertain it, I would ask uh, for the board to support turning the meters back on and enforcement back on on November 4th and suspending metering in the lots, again, the Russell Common lot and the railroad lot, the last Saturday uh, in uh, November and the first three Saturdays in December. Thank you. Mr. Diggins? Oh, Can I say so moved on that? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Carl. Second. Thank you. Uh -huh. All set, thank you. And Mr. Corsi? Uh, no comments, thank you. Yeah, and I just say I support this too. In you know, one of the other items that's happened in the center that I think was a good benchmark here is that we're just about wrapping up the sidewalk replacements, which look great. Um, I don't think it needs to be part of the me the metering. I don't know if it would be worthwhile having some sort of one-off ticket, you know, reversal if people didn't know when they got first got turned on, they get the first ticket reversed, but um, I, I don't think it's something that we need to be part of the, the motion at this time, but just a thought as the meters have been off for a while. I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of people complaining when they get the first ticket, thinking, not knowing that not everybody watches our meetings. I know we have the millions and millions of people at home as Mr. Greeley used to say, but um, we can discuss that further. All right, Attorney Heim, we have a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Carl. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. All right, and that takes us to item number eight, discussion and approval. Oops, sorry. Item number nine, discussion and vote, ex extension of the local state of emergency. Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, I'll keep this brief. Uh, the state of emergency, uh, both on a state level and from a, a Board of Health perspective, continues. I put a draft uh, extension of your prior declarations of emergency, both the original declaration and then your continuation of it. 
um, because your declaration expired in October, um, October of this year. So uh, this declaration would essentially extend the board's declaration, which as the board may recall, is for the primary purposes of making it clear that you know there's a state of emergency in town. There are certain measures that we're taking, such as closing town hall, requiring certain things of town employees, requiring certain measures by the town, but also for the purposes of reimbursement for state and federal aid uh, during a state of emergency. It's a helpful uh, local declaration to have made. So if the board has any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but it's, it's more or less the same thing with a blank for a new proposed date to extend the state of emergency um, within the body of the language and some updated you know, numbers on infections, both locally and statewide. All right, and I'll turn to the board for questions, comments, um, questions. Mr. Chair, if I could? Yes. Um, I'd like to move approval for an extension of the local state of emergency as outlined by Attorney Hine. Right, and do we have to add a date, Attorney Hine? I'm sorry, what's that, Mr. Chair? Do we have to add a date? Yeah, I, would, I just want a date for when we'll revisit this. And your recommendation is? Uh, you know, the last time the board went from June to October, I think, you know, basically a similar period of time. Would make sense? So April? Is that what you're saying till April? I think it would be helpful. That's a good point, Ms. Ms. Mrs. Mahan. would be helpful for the purposes leading up to town meeting. If I could, Mr. Chair, if I could make a motion to extend the local state of emergency until April of 2021. All right, Mr. Carroll. I'll second it. I, I was actually going to suggest that we, uh, you know, this is kind of, kind of like the, um, uh, the, the moving of the 11 o'clock rule, which mm -hmm. we're, um, <laughs> I fear we may be flirting with again tonight. Um, and I, I was tempted to, to suggest that we actually say it will remain in effect uh, until the Commonwealth of Massachusetts um, state of emergency is lifted. We have other language in there with a town manager or we could um, could lift it earlier. But but I'm happy to second your motion unless unless you would like to uh, change it, Ms. Mahan. Um, I will be guided by my colleague, Mr. Kiro and Attorney Heim, whether it's until April um, 2021 or in accordance with Mr. Carroll's language. So. Attorney Heim, if you could comment what would work best. I certainly think, yeah. I, so in the past, the board's discussion has been oriented towards, well, we don't want to extend this for longer than a date certain, but it's gone on for so long at this point in time that it, it, I don't think that there's any, I, I don't perceive any legal downside to uh, having it sync up with the Commonwealth if you don't want to keep on having to come back and renew it and renew it and renew it. As Mr. Kuro said, you could certainly um, basically uh, declare it over before the Commonwealth if you wanted to put it on the agenda and affirmatively do so. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that uh, I certainly think administratively it would be easier to sync it up with the uh, Commonwealth's uh, declaration if the board's inclined to do so. Okay, if it's... Um... Okay, with Attorney Heim and my colleague, Mr. Kiro and others, that we um, vote the extension of the local of local state of emergency concurrent with the um, state's declaration aforesaid there too, or any better language than that. Mr. Carl, that works for you a second. Uh, Mr. Corsi? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, good. No, no further comment. Mr. Dickens? I'm going to go with it, but I just do want to point out that I, I would like to revisit this um, notion at the end of February, because if it does look like we are going to be uh, under state of emergency through April, that will help guide us in determining what kind of town meeting we're going to have, because it's much easier to push for uh, another virtual town meeting uh, with the state of emergency. So I'll just say, you know, let's keep that in the back of our minds and maybe at the end of February, we come back and think about what things are looking like, but I'm going to support this motion as is. Yeah, I support this too. I think we might have been wishful thinking when we set it for October that maybe we'd have some movement, but that's not the case and who knows when that's going to come. So 
I think as the plan is to keep it in place to be concurrent with the, the state of emergency in the Commonwealth. So I think the language works. So Attorney Heim, we have a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Carroll. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. All right, and that brings us to number 10. This is a discussion that is continuing from 12.30 a.m. at our last meeting. Uh, so it's discussion and vote marijuana establishment host community agreement license applicants. One was Calix Peak of Massachusetts, Inc. to Hampshire Street, Suite 100B, Foxborough, Massachusetts by Edward Schmaltz. Second one was the Human Connection, LLC, 29 Florence Avenue, Arlington, Mass. by Jared Glansberger. So at the time we had heard from both applicants and we moved on to our discussion and vote portion. Um, so I'll open up to the board. It wasn't my plan to bring back the applicants since we had already heard their presentations and had the question and answer portions completed unless any board members have an inclination to do so. So I will start with uh, Mr. Diggins. Well, um, I had made my statement the last time it's pretty much the same. You know, I'll, I'll repeat it, but a little more briefly. Uh, uh, I uh, very much like uh, the human connection. I like the fact that it is in East Arlington. Uh, uh, it's in Precinct 3, uh, right across from Precinct 4. And the other one, um, other license is now in Precinct 1, right across from Precinct 3. And those two precincts, 3 and 4, have voted 2 to 1 um, for uh, recreational marijuana, which I know that there are potential Difficulties, I mean, um, with respect to traffic, I mean, but but I think if any two precincts should be um, willing to um, undertake that, it, it would be those two. I also like the notion that they are close to Cambridge and Somerville, and, and even though I'm not a vengeful person, uh, I mean, I will take retribution when it falls into my lap, and so I think it'd be kind of nice for Arlington to have recreational marijuana right across the line from Cambridge because they had, you know, liquor shops I mean, right across the line from Arlington for a while but when Arlington was dry. So it's an opportunity for us to um, grab some some like, income from from Cambridge. I mean, also I think the location, you know, for the Human Connection is far um, superior to um, Calix's. I mean. And the only issue that I think we need to surmount is the um, 2,000 foot um, separation between it and the other shop in um, East Arlington. So um, I'll stop there because my position hasn't really changed. Thank you. All right, Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, so just a, some comments. And, and I thought both presentations were very good last week. and, and um, Appreciated to both applicants um, staying on so late and, and providing good, good present. Lost your sound, Steve. Application because the um, the buffer is is just um, that that property, looking property line to property line is sixteen hundred eighty five feet. Um, there's no ability under the zoning bylaw to waive that 2,000 foot um, distance. And, and I will point out a year ago when Calix Peak um, applied at what was the Nicola Pizza site um, in Arlington Heights, they were about 1,970 feet from Apothka. Um, and if you went door to door, which is what the Human Connection um, suggested last week, if you went door to door from Buzzy's Bazaar to to the location on Broadway that may be over 2,000 feet. Apothka's front door to the to the corner door, of what used to be the entrance to Nicola Pizza, is over 2,000 square 2,000 linear feet. So we, we've applied a standard in the past of property line to property line. It seems unfair to me to now change that standard, um, particularly where there's an applicant who um, it was applied, I think, properly. Um, a year ago, but it, but they they unfortunately were 30 feet or less, and and what was a good location and what was a 
otherwise a good location and a good presentation based on the comment of the board members afterwards. I understand the issues with, with Calix Peak, but at the end of the presentations last year, Mr. Dunn and Mr. Kerr spoke specifically about the Calix Peak application. And I believe it was Mr. Dunn at the time encouraged them to look for another site in Arlington. They have found another site. The site complies with all the buffer zones and, and zoning. And I realize there are challenges with the neighborhood um, that I, I think are gonna have to be addressed to the environmental design review process with the ARB, but at least as before us for a host community agreement, I only see one qualified application. So I, I'm going to support the, the, the Calix Peak application for that reason. Is that a motion? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll move approval of, of the Calix Peak application. All right. Mrs. Mahan? Um, uh, I, I agree with my colleague, Mr. DeCourcy, with, regarding the human connection, the um, 2,000 foot buffer zone, as well as one of the tenants that we have. In terms of approving these, that there is site control and there was no determinant um, exact uh, site identification of where um, it would appear uh, the, the, the buzzy site uh, was put out as a possibility, but it wasn't um, ironclad in that. So because of those two reasons, the 2000 foot buffer and not having site control, I agree with my colleague, Mr. DeCourcy, um, in terms of the human connection doesn't rise to that. Um, in terms of Calix Peak, um, I, I, I'm happy to I, I, I second Mr. DeCourcy's uh, motion for discussion. I don't know if you all can hear me. It's saying my yeah, we're, we're connection is unstable, but but I would put out. Okay, am I back now? You are. Okay, so I I saw my. Cable was unstable, so I tried to slow down. I'll definitely second Mr. DeCourcy's motion for discussion, but um, I would say, and if Attorney Heim can either correct me or agree with me in terms of uh, just because we have one more um, uh, HCA to give out, we don't necessarily have to do that. Um, and I'd be interested in, in hearing from my other colleagues. So I, I would ask Attorney Heim, is that correct, what I just said? Uh, Mr. Chair, may I? Yep. Yes, Ms. Mohan, that's correct. Uh, that we have, there's not a cap on the number of HCAs. There's a cap on the total number of special permits or licenses that can be granted for retail and mar marijuana establishments. So there's already uh, two HCAs for retail marijuana in Arlington existing to date. And one of them is in the license application process before the Arlington Redevelopment Board, and the other one already has their special permit and is open. So what, in theory, um, there's not a cap on the HCAs, but if you have, but, but I would say that realistically speaking, there's only room for one more um, HCA, or you'd be giving out more HCAs than there are uh, licenses from the ARB. You don't have to give an HCA to anybody. Um, the sort of general guidepost is that we shouldn't be artificially suppressing the number of licenses available. Um, if you don't think an applicant or a site is attractive or um, appropriate, you don't have to give one. Um, so it's, all, it's ultimately within the board's discretion. Okay, so I, I definitely second Mr. DeCourcy's motion for discussion and right now I'm leaning towards a no but I'd like to hear from um, my remaining colleagues and, and thank you Mr. Chair and Mrs. DeCourcy. Mr. Carl? Um, thank you thank you very much Mr. Chair. So I, I'll tell you that um, I, I greatly respect the the uh, retail experience of Calix Peak. Um, I felt like for the town of Arlington, the proposal was put together by the Human Connection 
what was a superior uh, proposal. I thought that they spoke to a lot of the, 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 the local issues and having local ownership, which is a priority uh, for us. Um, and if that were as far as it went, um, I, I would be supporting or putting forward a motion to, to, um, to support uh, a host community agreement with the human connection. But the, the zoning issue is, is just a, um, it, it's a, it's a, um, it's a roadblock, I think, to, to, to doing so. Um, I don't feel comfortable with the uh, Calix Peak location. I, it does, strictly speaking, it meets the, um, the requirements of the application, but on qualitative grounds, uh, I think a lot of us know that intersection. Um, it worked okay as a gas station with some difficulties. It's gotten even, um, it it's act actually has a more uh, complicated um, configuration now since since some of the housing went in. Um, school routes, it's close by areas of um, uh, youth congregation and all that goes goes with that um, at Hills Hill and North Brown Park. Um, and I recognize that according to zoning that that's not a, a no starter, but qualitatively for me, it, it, it's an issue for me. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we had a, a proposal that was, to my mind, superior for the needs of, of, uh, of uh, the town of Arlington, met one of the pri priority categories, isn't meeting the, the, the zoning categories, but also has stated um, a desire to continue looking for a, a, um, a, a site that would um, fit. So I don't see any harm in, in holding off on, on granting of a, of a third HCA at this point. You know, I knew our first dispensary just opened uh, less than a month ago, and uh, the second one is not even quite approved yet. Um, so uh, uh, I, I am not inclined at this time to um, support either of the two um, applications. Thank you. All right, and so, I also was very impressed by the Human Connections presentation, as well as, you know, I love the idea of having a locally owned shop. Um, but I think with these applications, um, really the location is an integral part of the application. So to say, you know, We'd like the, the agreement, but we're gonna work with the town to find a new location. I just, I don't think that's grounds to grant the HCA to human connection based on that. And I think, you know, there's been some discussion back and forth, but yeah, it's pretty clear that the, the site that they're looking at right now just is not a viable site within the zoning bylaws. I spoke to another business owner in that site who wasn't even aware that there was any, you know, potential for a marijuana shop to go into that complex. So I don't know the viability of working that complex to find a suitable location. And so with that, I don't think that that's, I don't think we can approve an HCA for the human connection. I do, you know, I, Mr. Carl's got more experience with this locate, the location on Summer Street than me, but I think it's a workable location. Like I said before, you know, we've, when we first looked at the, applications way back when for the original HCAs, we were anticipating these swaths of people coming in and large lines, large traffic queuings. And I've seen the apothecas, I've observed apotheca a number of times and I haven't seen any sort of queuing like that. So I, I think it's more of a steady flow of people. Um, so I'm inclined to support the Calix Peak application for that site. And I would just say, you know, I think these applicants have known for a while that we're going to eventually put this HCA back out for bid. And we are very limited with, with the way that the bylaws is written. That we're very limited as to the locations where we can put one of these shops. And I think if, if a alternate suitable location existed, then one of the applicants would have located it. So I don't know if it's we have a, a good applicant here in Calix Peak who was very impressive in both presentations that we both, when they originally presented to us and the present, presentation that they made to us at the last meeting, that I think, you know, it, again, it's not, they don't have some of the draws that the human connection had for us 
for a locally owned shop, but you know, I, I do think it's a good, it was a good presentation and I think they'll do well in the location that they propose. Do we have any further discussion or comments? So Attorney Heim, we have a motion from Mr. DeCourcy, second by Mrs. Mahan to approve the HCA agreement for Calix Peak. Mrs. Mahan. No. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. No. Mr. Uh, Curo. No. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's a 2-3 vote. The motion does not carry. Do we have any alternate motions? All right, with that, this will close this agenda item. All right, we are now at 947 and about to start the warrant article hearing portion of this. So are we looking for I was going to say, Mr. Chair, can we take a do we break? Do a 10-minute break by a show of, of nods? Uh, how long, Mr. Ten Chair? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, OK. Mr. Great. Chair, I'm sorry. We should take it by roll call. I apologize. I, <laughs> I know it's silly. A 10-minute break? Oh, if OK. You're move, if, if, if there's a motion. Unless you're just uh, declaring it as the chair. So I was going to declare it. I think that's what we did last yeah, time. Fair enough. So it will be consistent. All right. Thank you, so sir. People can be mad at me if they All right. So we'll take a 10-minute break. It's now 9.48. We'll come back at 10 o'clock. Okay. Thank you. All right. So that takes us to item number 11 on our agenda. Warrant article hearings and votes. So as many people know that this is a unique set of warrant article hearings. A number of these warrant articles were proposed for our spring, annual spring uh, town meeting for 2020. And due to a global pandemic, we pushed these off for the safety of our town meeting members only handled um, the financial articles that we needed to keep our town running in the spring town meeting that happened in June. So there's been a little bit of confusion both online and with some of the correspondence that we've received, I know we've all received regarding the hearing process. So we do have, we have five articles that were either, are either new articles or have been substantially changed since they were originally proposed to us for the spring town meeting. Those five articles will have new Warren article hearings. I'll let, let attorney Heim get a little more in depth here, but the remaining articles we have on for final, final votes and comments, all articles, which would be article three, four, seven, nine, 11, 12, 13, and 15, we had warrant article hearings for all of those articles back in January, February into March of last year. We did have public input on all those articles and all those articles are the same as they were, or substantially the same as they were proposed at that time. Um, and they're just being resubmitted as they're pushed off due to the, the pandemic in the spring. So I just do wanna address some miscommunications and misinformation that's been put out there, some of which was is by residents who were participated in those those hearings back in uh, January and February. That all of these articles have had public input; they've all had public hearings, and just and now we're taking them up for final votes and comments be, to put them forth to the for the special town meeting. And as Mr. Diggins was present, but not voting in the, during those hearings. Um, so Attorney Heim, if, if you have anything at, to add to the introduction, please do so. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, I'll, I'll try not to go over the same territory, but again, as a reminder uh, for members of the board and the public, the focus of the special town meeting on November 16th is to take up business, which was essentially tabled during the truncated 2020 annual town meeting due to COVID-19 pandemic. So in that vein, 
the board has two sets of warrant article actions that should probably have been broken out into two separate agenda items. In the first bucket, you have warrant article hearings on articles five, six, eight, 10, and 25. Um, my understanding is that at least two of those items are likely to be tabled at the request of the proponents until the next meeting. But these items were slated for hearings because uh, they were either articles which weren't on the 2020 annual town meeting warrant, uh, Article 10 and Article 25. They weren't previously voted upon by the board prior to the annual town meeting, or they were voted upon positively and negatively, but the proponents of those articles requested changes to the substance of the warrant articles, which materially affects the board's prior posture. Each of those items is discussed individually for the purposes of a board vote and development of a record for the comments. The second bucket, articles three, four, seven, nine, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, you have your final votes, draft final votes and comments. And these are matters on which the board both held hearings and voted on a recommendation to town meeting. And the purpose of discussing the articles now is to ensure that the draft votes and comments reflect the board's uh, vote and intentions in terms of their recommendations to town meeting. Final votes and comments are taken up by the board collectively with the board members noting instances where there's specific edits to votes or comments that they'd like to be changed or elaborated upon. If the board and the public are willing to indulge me for a moment, I'd like to make a special note on Article 15 because I've heard from both board members and members of the public on the draft vote and comment before you. The vote as drafted in the board's materials has two ingredients that are meant to pr uh, prevent inappropriate candidates from being appointed as these retired detail officers. And I think we all understand uh, some you know, serious concerns that some folks have about this in our current sort of uh, context. The first is that the language of the special acts make it very clear that appointment is purely discretionary and it requires the recommendation of the police chief. And that means that an appointment can be denied for any non-discriminatory reason, and neither candidates nor appointees have civil service or collectively bargained rights to the appointment or to maintain the appointment. Indeed, the manager uh, can essentially terminate anybody from detail work with or without cause. This is the most important ingredient because this is what we're oftentimes sort of circling around when it comes to employee discipline and the nature of collectively bargained rights. Second, uh, based on the comments from both the public and the board, um, officers aren't eligible if they were involuntarily separated, involuntarily separated from employment or have any active administrative or disciplinary matters open against them upon voluntary separation. So the idea there is that someone who was terminated can't be then hired back as a retired officer for detail, or similarly, someone can't quit voluntarily for the purpose of trying to avoid some sort of disciplinary matter. That might be a stain on the record. To allay any further anxiety without creating an unworkable standard so that if somebody was disciplined for insubordination or being late um, and therefore isn't eligible to be uh, serve on a detail in retirement, um, I have drafted some language that I think addresses uh, the public's concerns if the board would like to add a third ingredient. And the proposed language that uh, I would add is, uh, in addition to language about um, outstanding administrative discipline or dis disciplinary charges levied against them at the time of retirement, that they would not be eligible um, if they had been subject to, quote, duty restrictions or assignment modifications as a result of a disciplinary action for misconduct within the last however many years, five to 10 years prior to their retirement. So what that meant, what that meant to capture is that if there's a discipline that's meted out that results in a modification of what someone's assignment is or their duty such that they can't be uh, occupying some role in the police department because of a disciplinary matter taken against them, that's significant enough to trigger that this isn't somebody that we want um, to be working on a detail so uh, in retirement. So I hope that that allays uh, some folks' concerns if the board's inclined to add that. And I'm only bringing that up now because I understand that folks are very concerned about this, but we've got a lot of warrant article hearings that, we would, uh, in, that we're gonna individually take up and then final votes and comments, which 
as I said, are taken up by the board in mass and sort of discussed among the board, not, not as a public hearing. So Mr. Hurd, unless there's any questions from the board, um, I hope that summary is helpful both to you and to the public. Yes, thank you. And I guess this is just a new chair question for you. Since it's not posted separately, can I take, can we vote on the final votes and comments section before we take on the Warren article hearings? Do we have a You can take up business in whatever order you like, Mr. Hurd. So if you wanna take on final votes and comments before you take on the Warren article hearings, you may do so. Yep, so I, I think logistically that is probably the easiest way to do this. Um, so in, as in years past, what I'll do is I'm just gonna, we have, a separate group of articles here for final votes and comments with attorney Hines comments on it, our previous, um, in our previous votes. So I, I just want to go through each article. I'll name them off and take it to the board for a raise of hands. If anyone has any questions, comments, revisions that they want to make to that particular article. Um, so the first one that we have here is Article three, bylaw amendment, regulation of outdoor lighting, uplighting. Are there any additional comments or revisions regarding that, that one? All right, article four, bylaw amendment, Minuteman bikeway hours. Do we have any additional comments, revisions for that one? And of course, Mr. Diggins, if you have any questions or comments, just let me know. Right. Article seven, vote bylaw amendment, envision Arlington updated language. Any questions, revisions, comments? All right. So, article nine. Vote election modernization modernization committee. Any revisions to that article? Article eleven, home rule legislation. Justin Brown. My only comment to this one is once I when I went back through these for final votes and comments, I I felt bad. I, I feel like that's one that we should have pulled out for Mr. Brown. To vote in the June town meeting, but I'm glad we're taking it up here. Article 12. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Just a question on Article 11. And, and when we had discussed that back in the spring, there was a period of time that we were going to put into the um, into the um, recommended vote. And I still see that that time is there, but have we added any time to account for the additional six months or is it the same timetable? Because I, I just want to give him the opportunity to get on a list and, and take an exam. Attorney Hine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Uh, DeCourcy, that's a very good point. Um, I can add six months to the December 31st, 2020 deadline. Okay, great, thank you. And, and Mr. Chair. Yes. Well, we, we have um, a notation there in the, um, Final votes and comments saying Mr. Brown is 38 years old. Is that still accurate? He may be 39 at this point. I'm just saying we should um, make sure we update it. <laughs> I will check with Mr. Brown. Very good. I'm sure we have the answer. All right. So with those revisions, we'll move on to Article 12. Home Rule Legislation Consolidation of Town Meeting Member Elections. Any comments or revisions? All right. All right. Article 13, Home Rule Legislation, Rank Choice Voting. Mr. Diggins. Do you all have it in you to um, rehear that? Look, I mean, I know it's 4 0, and I support it, it uh, and so the vote's not going to change. It, uh, it, uh, I went back and I looked at the material that was presented, uh, and and I just want more substance. You know, I'd like to challenge both sides to more substance. That said, I mean, I know chances are we're going to have 
only have one more meeting and we may have a number of hearings on that one. I don't want us to have a, a long night, you know? So if folks are like, no, Len, not a good idea, I mean, um, that's okay. I can probably have this comment, these conversations that I'd like to have um, with both sides I mean, um, um, on my own. Uh, so it's not my only opportunity, but I just put it out there as a friendly- I'll, I'll um, put it to the board voice. for comment. My I'm leaning towards not having a hearing because I think we, you know, we had the phones out there that they had sure. a very thorough hearing. Um, sure. But that's fine. Um, and I think, you know, most, we're all with, with the vote for zero. Sure. But, um, Ms. Carl, do you have any comments? Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think we should be consistent in our, in our practice here. And we did have the hearing. I, I do anticipate just from some of what we've seen that there'll probably be a lot of debate on this at, at town meeting. Uh, but well, one thing I will, I will um, also just throw into the mix here though, is that um, as your newly appointed liaison to the election modernization committee, um, the, the, the committee did, did discuss whether or not they wanted to bring back their articles in, in this um, special town meeting. I wanted to wait until the annual and, and part of the logic in, in bringing this forward at this time um, was that it's the statewide ballot um, uh, question as well. And so that people will have been exposed to a lot of education around ranked choice voting in, in the run up to town meeting. So I, I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, but I, I, I think my inclination is we should be consistent with, um, with the standard we set for what we're hearing, what we're not hearing, so. Mr. Corsi? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Mr. Caro, and, and I think you know this was an instance where Mr. Diggins wanted to move reconsideration because he had a different position. I think that's a different story outside the outside the hearing process. But in, in terms of hearings for consistency, I agree with Mr. Caro. Hey, Ms. Zaman. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. How's that? Thanks. Thanks for. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Yeah. All right. And so we have article 14, if I can get to it. Home rule legislation, senior water discount. Any questions, comments, revisions? All right. And that takes us to article 15, home rule re legislation, retired police officer details. Is there anyone that would like to offer a revision to the language? Mr. Carroll. Yeah, thank you. Well, first I wanna uh, just thank the uh, town council for putting in the good standing standard uh, into the, the qualifications. I mean, it's, it, you know, in addition to the, the health standards and, and uh, other uh, qualif minimal qualifications that are in there. But the town council did just give us at the, at, in his opening remarks, some additional language that could potentially allay some of the concerns in the community. Um, and uh, I, I think it would be helpful to put that um, formulation in here, um, if possible. And um, whether it's five years or ten years, I mean, I'm I'm fine with discussing that. But um, if town council through you could repeat the uh, formulation that he had, yes, attorney Han. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kuro. So in addition to um, the good standing requirement signifying that an officer has not been involuntary, involuntarily separated from employment or had outstanding administrative discipline or disciplinary charges levied against them at the time of retirement, they would not be eligible if they have been subject to duty restrictions or assignment modifications as a result of a disciplinary action for misconduct within the last whatever period the board thinks is appropriate prior to their retirement. So I would like to move that as an amendment to our recommended vote. Um, and I'll, I'll move it at 10 years and, and the move question. to the board's discussion. I'm sorry, Mr. Chimmy. I'll, I'll, I'll second it for discussion. I, I'm still absorbing it, so I, I, I don't have any comments right now. 
right. I'm sorry, Ms. Ma Mr. Chair, should I break it down a little bit slower? I'm sorry, I'm speaking fairly quickly on it. Sure. So the, it's sort of a three piece thing here that they can have been subject to duty restrictions or assignment modifications as a result of disciplinary action for misconduct within the last five, 10 years prior to the retirement. So the key pieces are no, uh, they can't have been subject to duty restrictions or assignment modifications as a result of a disciplinary action for misconduct. And just to anticipate some questions, there might be somebody who's injured in the line of duty that has a duty restriction. Uh, there might be someone who has an assignment modification for, you know, uh, as an accommodation or something like that. But it's duty restrictions or assignment modifications as a result of disciplinary action for misconduct within the last however many years prior to their retirement. And the idea there is that if we just have a very broad language that says discipline, that will capture a lot of things that probably aren't at the center of a lot of our community conversations. You know, things happen on the job, people insubordination, stuff like that. Um, similarly, if we try to list every single thing, like, you know, excessive force or a false arrest or discourtesy, there might be something that's not captured within a list. Um, so this is meant to reflect that if somebody's misconduct has resulted in a modification of what they're basically allowed to do um, as, as an officer, then that's uh, would prohibit them from, and again, this is only relative to a totally discretionary appointment for um, retired police officers to work details. Okay. Mrs. Mahan? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. No comment. Mr. Diggins? Uh, I'm fine with that. Thanks. All right, Attorney Heim, so can we vote on action on the article with the amendment that was suggested by Mr. Carl, or do we have to push this for final votes and comments to the next meeting? No, you traditionally, Mr. Chair, you vote on the final comments in a batch, final votes and comments in one batch. Yep. So you vote to approve final votes and comments as amended by the board um, in a batch of votes. All right. And so just to clarify the motion, so Mr. Carroll, are you moving to vote on all final votes and comments with the modifications as noted? Oh, this is the last one. I'm happy to do that. Yep. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, may I ask one question? I apologize. Yep. Um, Mr. Diggins, uh, just to make it clear, you, you have the option of basically having these things be, you know, your 5-0 vote, uh, adding your vote to make it a 5-0 vote, or as we've also done sometimes in the past, uh, making it, you know, that it's essentially a vote and then, you you know, uh, are, we're newly, a newly elected member of the board. However you want to handle that is is fine. Yes, Mr. Diggins. Well, well, let's say, um, let's say I wanted to give um, uh, Mr. Dunn credit for the votes and the work that he did on it. Would there be a way to do that? You uh, know, um, absolutely. Yes, we okay. can have it reflect that they were the votes of the prior board. I believe that's what we did with Mr. DeCourcy when he was uh, newly elected to the board. Is that correct, Mr. DeCourcy? Yeah, that, that that's right. What what we did is. The board's votes were listed, and then I, I, I think actually at the town meeting, Mr. Dunn at the time said, had Mr. DeCourcy voted, he would have voted this way or the other. But I think you know, we could do that in the comments as well. I did, it's, it's however, however um, the chair would prefer, I guess. Does that work for me if that works for Mr. Diggins? Yes, yes. I, mean, I very much like Mr. Dunn to get credit for the votes, I mean, for, for the work that he did and the votes that he participated in. And and I can say now that a, I mean, you can add that I am in agreement um, with them all. 
or not, me meaning that I am in agreement, you can add that or not, but please give Mr. Dunn credit for the votes that he, for the hearings that he participated in. Thank you. Understood, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I just have a question. Yep. Um, what I've written down is right now we have a motion by Mr. Kiro, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy on Article 15, and now we're also discussing the- sure. Oh. I, Mr. Carl had, correct me if I'm wrong, but had amended his motion given that Article 15 is the last article that we have in final votes and comments to move favorable, favorable action on all of the final votes and comments subject to the modifications that we discussed. Okay, so his motion would be to move on articles three, four, seven, nine, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15? Yes. Okay, and I'm in agreement with that, thank you. All right, and Mr. Corsi, your second remains? Yes. All right, Attorney Hahn? Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Uh, Mr. Diggins, I'm just going to take your vote for the purposes of uh, just having the record reflect our discussion. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I was going to ask you how should I vote. So I was, I was, was it was yes or abstain, so I think I say yes. Okay. I think I understand what the board's, what the board's doing and, and, and reflecting the votes of when Mr. Dunn was on the board, but your overall agreement with these articles. Thank yes. Uh, Mr. Kuro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous, it's unanimous vote. Thank you. Yes. And that takes you. So, as mentioned before, at the request of the proponents of two of the Warren articles, um, we're going to table those to the next meeting. So, do we? And I assume we need a motion to table those two items, Attorney Heim. Sorry, you're on mute. You know, yeah, yes, I guess we should table uh, the articles that aren't going to be discussed tonight until the next meeting. All right, so do we have a motion to table Article 8 and Article 25 until our next regularly scheduled meeting? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> I'm going to go with a motion by Mr. Carl, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Attorney Hahn. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Nanus vote. All right, so that brings us to our warrant article hearings that we'll have tonight. First article up is Article 5, Home Rule, Rule Legislation, Bylaw Amendment, Fossil Fuel Infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to recuse myself from this Warren article. When we heard it back in the spring, I recused myself as well um, for, for work I do for National Grid. So I'm going to, um, I'll shut off my video and, and mute myself. Thank you. And the record will reflect that at this time, Mr. DeCourcy has muted himself and shut off his video um, as a recusal. All right, and Mr. Chaplain, do we have the proponent with us? Mr. Hanlon and Mr. Meeks, welcome. Hey, um, we have Mr. Chap. I wonder if we have one additional person who's on the steering committee, Ann Wright, who is able to do it because the meeting she had earlier is over. Yep, Ms. Wright's with us as well. Great. <clears throat> um, we'll try to be, we will succeed in being um, brief here. Um, it seems like a thousand years ago that we got together to have our first hearing on this, but it was only March 9th. And at that time, uh, we presented the detail of the policy that's involved here. Um, and the board had a discussion and we had a back and forth. And uh, Mr. Dunn moved um, uh, approval of uh, that the board support this uh, Warren article. And uh, that 
motion carried uh, four to nothing. And really what we're coming back here for today is except in a few details, exactly the same as the Warren article we had then. It involved, as, as Mr. Himes' memo shows, it involves a, uh, a prohibition of new fossil fuel piping or infrastructure uh, in new construction and in what essentially gut re rehabilitations with a fairly large number of exemptions, all of which are designed to make this an entirely realistic policy. So for example, one exemption would be for, for hot water in large, uh, in large buildings. Uh, we heard from Karen Kelleher, who's on the uh, HPIC and is a town meeting member for uh, Precinct 5, uh, that that it really basically addressed the concerns uh, of the affordable housing community and that actually affordable housing is leading the way in all electric construction. And there are several other exemptions which all in one way or another are designed to achieve the same common sense, uh, uh, common sense uh, 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 limitations on what otherwise might be a unacceptably broad um, uh, prohibition. Um, so the board approved that. Uh, we were following the lead here of Brookline, which had adopted a very similar ordinance or bylaw uh, earlier, and that was pending before uh, the Attorney General. And we knew there was a, and the board knew that there was a risk that if we proceeded with the uh, bylaw that we were proposing, uh, that the Attorney General would find that it was not consistent with state law. Uh, there is a major issue uh, in term because of the broad laws occupying the field involving uh, the regulation of the sale of natural gas, uh, involving the building code and involving the gas code all of which are actually sort of different in their purposes from the environmental purpose that we have, uh, but which nevertheless have been held in several cases over the course of time to essentially preempt local, local regulation. So we waited a long time for the Attorney General. Uh, there was a very thorough consideration. Uh, and in July, she rendered an opinion. And the opinion had good news and bad news. The good news is she said that if she were, if it were left up to her, she agreed with the policy uh, that we had and was supportive and was reluctantly do, giving us the bad news, which was she also agreed with the industry that under the existing state law, this was preempted by all three of the statutes that I just mentioned to you. Um, well, <clears throat> the nature of the finding is really that uh, home rule, or the regular home rule that we have doesn't extend far enough uh, to justify this legislation. That's because the state legislature has essentially occupied the field and what the state, state legislature could do, the state legislature could undo. So after having long faces for much of an afternoon, we turned around and said, well, we don't have to stop here. We can just go to the source of state law, the state, the general court, uh, and ask for authorization to do what we've proposed to do. Brookline went through the same thinking and is in the process in the town meeting, which is starting either this week or next, um, of asking for a home rule petition as well. Um, in the home rule petition, that the language that, uh, that Attorney uh, uh, Heim has before you uh, focuses primarily on the authorization for future action um, that we would like to see from the state legislature. Um, also, we would we would like to be able to perfect the uh, statute that you're the ordin the bylaw that you uh, supported before. There are a few small changes that need to be made or that need to be at least considered. Like it's been seven months later and we still have the same effective date. So we may want to consider changing that. But in substance, that's really the same as the as what we had before. Um, and so what you're looking, we're looking to have at the end of this is the same thing Brookline would have if, the, if they prevail as well, 
a ratification of the ordinance that they started with, together with a fairly broad authorization for future action so that as, as time goes on and we need to, and the town meeting needs to take further action, either to make this looser, to make it harder, to change waiver criteria or whatever, that we can do that without also going through a uh, special legislation process again. Um, so that's pretty much where we are. Um, as we mentioned last time, we had undertaken outreach. We took a long vacation for outreach for obvious reasons, uh, but are beginning to do that again. We have on November 12th, another forum established to uh, update town meeting members and, and others who, on uh, what this legislation is all about, its purpose, the economics behind it, and all of the things that we generally addressed, uh, addressed uh, to you last March. Um, and we're hoping that to have a highly educated town meeting by the time it starts uh, on November 16th. Um, so I'm gonna stop here. Uh, Amos and uh, is our expert on everything that has to do with the environment and energy. And Anne is our expert on those things too. Anne is uh, from Mothers Out Front and Amos is from uh, is co-chair of Sustainable Arlington, uh, and I'm just a town meeting member, but the three of us have been the steering committee from that. Uh, but in terms of the process that we've gone through, Anne is the particular expert for that. If anyone has any questions about the underlying policy or the underlying operation of the statute, the geeky things are for me, but the interesting science is all for Amos. And so with that, um, I'll, I'll stop now and uh, invite any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. So I'll turn to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. Mr. Carl? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move favorable action. Um, and uh, to just say I appreciate the, the work and the, uh, the nimbleness in, uh, in reacting to the, uh, the changing situation following the uh, ruling in Brookline. I, I think that, you know, we would all agree that um, an ideal outcome of this would be if we and some of the other communities um, <clears throat> submit home rule petitions along these these lines that uh, the Commonwealth would see fit to um, you know adopt legislation that that would that would uh, give all communities um, disability um, um, or or would extend extend this uh, uniformly uh, throughout the Commonwealth. They're very similar to what we did last year with uh, we did a home rule petition. Um, around extending voting rights to, to, um, to um, non-citizens for local elections, realizing that many other municipalities are doing the same and in hopes that there'll be a change at the state level. So thank you very much. And uh, um, I'm, I'm glad to see that we're able to uh, still keep the ball moving forward and that uh, your extraordinary outreach efforts uh, are continuing. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan? I'd like to second that. All right, Mr. Dickens? Um, no comment. I'm fine with it. Thanks. Yep. And you know, we, we heard this very similar. We had a very similar Warren article hearing last uh, February. And we all voted <clears throat> in favor of this. And I mentioned then, I mentioned now, you know, I had spoken with a HVAC contractor at that time who was in support of, of, of this type of legislation because he said the, the equipment that, the new equipment that's more efficient that complies with the, the what we're looking for here is what they're installing in a lot of the new construction anyways because of its usefulness to the homeowners. So I will support this. Um, without any additional comments or questions, Attorney Heim, we have a motion by Mr. Caro of favorable action, so, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Let the record reflect that Mr. DeCourcy recused himself, therefore it is a 4 0 one vote. Thank you. Thank you all for sticking with thank that. Thank you. All right. We'll wait for Mr. DeCourcy to rejoin us, which he has. So, as of right now, the record can reflect that Mr. DeCourcy is now a bit back with us. 
And that takes us to a warrant article for article uh, for hearing for article number six, which is vote establishment of police civilian advisory board study committee. Do you have Mr. Weinstein with us? Mr. Weinstein, Hi. Hello. your name and address, and then tell us a little bit about your article. Yeah, uh, Jordan Weinstein, uh, Lennon Road, Precinct 21 in Arlington. Um, thanks for rehearing this. Um, this article was somewhat different when it was first uh, proposed to you guys, uh, you folks. Um, over time, uh, I got a lot of feedback, not just from uh, you folks on the select board, but also from other people, town meeting members, and others that I met throughout my uh, travels uh, and uh, talked about this. Um, so when we were offered the chance to rewrite this somewhat, uh, given the time delay and uh, you know the changes since it was originally submitted, I just wanted to point out a few of the changes that we made in response to uh, some of the feedback that we got. Um, the first thing was uh, in the text, we clarified what the purpose of a police civilian review board was, what, what was it that we were actually talking about because people were having questions about what can a civilian re review board do. And we basically tried to clarify it that the purpose was uh, number one, that it, it would be independent from the police department that it would have the authority to receive and investigate complaints. Um, uh, something that I know is done by the police department itself and other bodies within Arlington, but we felt that this would be uh, a benefit to have this, uh, a safe place for people to file complaints uh, that have to do with their interaction with the police. Um, and also that uh, this, this uh, study uh, or, or the type of civilian review board that we're suggesting or, or would hope uh, would come out of this, would be able to review police services and make recommendations for improvement. Uh, the second thing we did was remo we removed the requirement that the study committee actually submit a warrant article to create a civilian review board at the end of its work. Instead, um, the study committee in its, uh, in its current uh, text would report its findings and recommendations to town meeting next year. So then it would be, again, up to town meeting. Um, and uh, finally, I might be missing something, but we moved the, the phrase or take any action related thereto to the very end so that the entire, any part of the warrant can be uh, amended by town meeting. That's about it. Uh, I, and I guess basically I hope that we can find some way to move forward on this uh, in a, uh, a positive and uh, uh, in, in a way that uh, seeks to simply improve on what we already have here in Arlington. Thank you, Mr. Weinstein. Before I go to the board, I, I'll just note that I inadvertently forgot to reach out for public comment on the last article. Um, I think we probably... Oh didn't have anything on that, but we will have that on this article if anyone's concerned about that. So first I'll go to Mr. Carl. Um, th thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Weinstein for bringing this forward. I I'm glad that the, um, that some of the technical issues with, with the, um, and, and substantive um, concerns, I think, with the, with the original warrant article have been addressed. I, I think in, as we approach this discussion, <laughs> I think anybody who's been hanging on to the meeting until now, I hope that they'll, they'll look back to the, um, the one and a half hour long kennel hearing that we just had. Um, and, uh, and even more so, go into, our, go into our agenda and our packet and read the extensive report on that because um, it gives you a flavor of um, what a lot of the police work is uh, actually within, our, within Arlington. Um, you know, I know the slogan's proactive and proud, but some of it's persistent and patient and trying to persuade uh, folks to resolve, resolve disputes. Um, 
But I think that that's instructive because as we know on the board, a lot of times folks don't, can't resolve a dispute, whether it's two neighbors or whatnot, and they go to, to an intermediary. And I think that that's why this is being brought forward in our, in our um, <clears throat> final community conversation. I think it was even, it was even raised. I mean, there are well-established um, procedures for um, filing a complaint um, through the police department's mechanisms. I would expect that those would continue, but some people for one reason or another don't feel comfortable and would like to have an alternative mechanism. That, that said, um, I did circle around to Mr. Weinstein. I think I had some uh, points that I had raised when we had our initial hearing in this. Um, some of them were addressed with the changes, some of them uh, not, not, not fully. Um, so I want to just throw out on the table a, a few things that I think w would make this an even a stronger uh, proposal going into um, town meeting. Um, <clears throat> I think that it is important that any study committee um, not only review police services, but, but examine the experience of comparable communities, not just large city experience, but also comparable communities to Arlington and how these types of complaint mechanisms work. Um, consider the potential impacts of pending legislation because that could be significant. We know that there's legislation at Beacon Hill that's, that's in, in uh, conference. Um, <clears throat> and as a practical matter, although the, uh, the warrant article envisions bringing recommendations forth to the um, 2021 annual town meeting, I mean, that seems to me to be a vestige of it being submitted for the annual. Uh, last year under pre-COVID circumstances. It, as a um, practical matter, you're going to be lucky to have the committee up and running and able to, to meet, you know, very many times before our upcoming um, ATM. So, so I would suggest that if a study committee is put together, that it um, uh, develop its recommendations for consideration either by, by the 2022 2022 annual town meeting or any earlier annual or special town meeting or, or other appropriate administrative management or elected or appointed officials. And, and those special and annuals that are opportunities for the committee to report out if they choose, choose to do so. I just, I don't think as a practical matter, um, <clears throat> setting in stone the, the, the 2021. Um, and like we would often do with town meeting committees, um, the study committee would dissolve with the dissolution of the 2022 ATM um, unless town meeting chose to extend or, or, or shorten it prior. Um, when we had our hearing, I also raised some questions about um, some of the membership, although I think there was a pretty solid um, group of, of um, members that are proposed in the article. Um, I did have some questions about the Equal Opportunity Advisory Committee, which, which deals with hiring matters. And, and I think in circling around, um, it, it was suggested that, that the Diversity Task Group might be a more appropriate body to fill that role on the, on the committee. Um, <clears throat> I think the other groups that are listed there are fine. However, um, I think that I had mentioned in our original hearing that I thought that it was important that we reach out for a designee of the Council on Aging uh, because our seniors um, are particularly dependent upon the police. They're also particularly vulnerable to um, crime and fraud and, 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 and all else. And I think that's an important um, voice. I think I suggested a designee of the Monotomy Manor Tenants Association which has a substation of the police department also closely partners partners with depends on um, the uh, police services. I'd suggested a student from Arlington High School that they, they, um, they interact with our SRO on a, on a daily basis. And I'm not sure if I suggested that time or not, but I think it's important that um, any study committee include a graduate of the Citizens Police Academy, which has gone through and has has had from a, from a resident's point of view, an inside look at, at how the police department um, uh, operates. Um, and then, you know, lastly, um, uh, my recommendation, I, I think the warrant article suggests um, 
um, one town meeting member. I, I recommend that we put three town meeting members on, on there. That makes a total of 13 voting members because I'll guarantee you, and we all know from our experience, you're gonna to get to the floor of town meeting and, and someone will move and say, we want more town meeting rep representation. We have a lot of um, experience within, within the bodies. Um, I also pointed out since then to the proponent that there are some kind of mechanical and process issues that, that, that should be um, addressed. And you know, we run into this all the time. Um, there's something in there about the quorum, uh, about the way that decisions are made, but you should specify the quorum and, and, and such, and also specify how the committee is gonna come together initially. So um, my recommendation is that the, uh, the non-voting members of, of a committee include the three that are listed there, the chief of police or the designee, the diversity equity inclusion coordinator, the designee town council or designee, but also that one member of the select board be designated and that the, <clears throat> it's on the member of the select board to convene the initial meeting of the study committee uh, so that it can self-organize, elect a chair and such that would be responsible for uh, subsequent meetings and um, posting of minutes and agendas and, and all of that. Um, those are my thoughts. Most of those I think I expressed during the initial hearing. I'm glad that that or take any other action related there too was, was moved where it was that we can make some of these, which I would suggest are improvements to the, to the, uh, the proposal um, to move it to town meeting for uh, consideration. So I would like to move favorable action with, with some of those parameters for discussion. I'm sure other board members will have um, thoughts on it. Mr. Diggins? I'll second that motion. Uh, and Mr. Kuro covered a lot and, and, and I really don't have anything to add to his suggestions. And, um, yeah, um, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll stop at this point. Maybe I'll come back later, but I think I'm, I'm good for now. Mrs. Mahan? Um, I'm a little confused here because uh, the initial board vote was um, to vote no action because our police chief indicated that she would be compiling the stakeholders um, of this group of people. Um, and it's my understanding she has done that, um, if I could, um, through you, Mr. Chair, ask Mr. Chapdelaine, and then if I could get, if I'm incorrect in any way, uh, get the forum back so I can continue talking about this. But it's, it's and it, if I'm wrong, I would ask the town manager to correct me on this, but my understanding is Chief Flaherty has contacted stakeholders um, from the original Warren article, which is why the board originally voted no action um, to assemble that group together, and that's been happening. But if Mr. Chapterling could correct me either way if I'm right or wrong. So, uh, Mr. Chair, may I? Yes. Um, so back in the spring, uh, Mrs. Mahan is referring to Chief Flaherty's proposal to create a chief advisory committee. Um, given ongoing discussions in town, the chief had sort of uh, held pat for a while in form, uh, forming that committee, but uh, she is now moving forward with putting it together. I gave her my approval on a letter she plans to send out to all the stakeholders that were outlined in her proposal for the Chief's Advisory Committee uh, back in the spring. I, I can't confirm that she has sent the letter out, but I know um, I know it was close to being finalized, finalized and may have went out last week to begin to bring that committee together. Okay, so I um, I get what, what I would say to my colleagues, and I'm trying to process this right now in my head, is that um, initially when we heard this Warren article, the chief indicated she would be um, assembling the stakeholders together. It's my understanding that's pretty much in the end phase of doing that. Um, and I know she was cognizant of, uh, with the exception of what Mr. Kiro suggested in terms of uh, representative from the Council on Aging, 
and someone from the high school in terms of a student, I don't know that that's necessarily one of the stakeholders that were identified in that. So my, my um, inclination would be to uh, allow the chief to continue on um, with that stakeholder committee that I believe has been set up, but I don't know 100%. Um, but I would also ask that um, Chief Flaherty also make sure that there is someone from Council on Aging and from our student council uh, or students as Mr. Carroll has identified. So I would be voting no action on this just because I don't wanna put this into a study committee with the chief is already moving forward has identified stakeholders. They've been contacted the committees being constituted, but I do think perhaps there are uh, two areas that Mr. Kiro identified in terms of the Council on Aging and um, the student representative that needs to um, make sure has, has a seat on the table. So um, I'll be voting no action because I wanna support Chief Flaherty in the um, committee that she's, it sounds like from the town manager and from the chief from correspondence that we received um, that has been identified and is beginning to meet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If we are Mr. Corsi, Mr. Weinstein, I, I will let you respond. I just wanna go through the board first, if you don't mind. Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I have a few comments. And, and first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Weinstein for the, the changes that he submitted in the Warren article. And then just speaking for myself, uh, some of the, the, the language that, that was used in the spring prevented me, among other reasons, from, from supporting the Warren article. Um, I appreciate the fact that you've moved, take any action related there to, to the end. And, and a big issue I had earlier this year was that the committee had presupposed going back to town meeting with, with the creation of the board. And I, I, I wasn't comfortable with that because I thought the work should be done. And then when the work's done, the recommendation comes out of the work. Um, so I, I'm glad that that came out. One comment on the additional language, I think that was your, your point one on the clarified charge of what a, a review board would look like. Um, I, I'd almost like to see, you know, this be included among the alternatives that a, that a committee, a study committee would look at and, you know, whether it's a review board or an advisory board what comes out of that study process is what should be brought to town meeting. So I'm a little concerned that that may be limiting in terms of the scope of what's going to be studied. But I, I, I want to um, hear from, uh, um, maybe hear from my colleagues if they have any further thoughts on that. Um, as to the voting members, I, I think it makes good sense to add the, the individuals that Mr. Curo mentioned I, I, by my count we're getting to 14 mr Kira. I, I, wherever we end up it should be an odd number of was 13, of, 13. Um, of, of members okay and and i will say and, and this is an issue i've had with other committees um with non-voting members i i feel that particularly with the, the police chief if we're going to be talking about changes i think the police chief or a designee should be a voting member of any committee any study committee um I don't think the town council should be a member, and, and I think you know, it's somewhat unfair to, to require him to go to meetings um, as a, as a non-vote member if, the, if there's work that needs to be, questions that come up and he needs to be consulted, that's fine. But I, you know, we ask a lot of our town employees and, and you know, one to make them go to meetings and not even have a vote at the meetings, I, I, I think is, is, is problematic and, and I think given his position, I don't think he should have a vote on this committee, but he, I, I also don't think he should be required to go to every, to every meeting. Um, with Ms. Harvey, the diversity, equity, inclusion coordinator, I think if she's gonna be on it, that, that, that she should have a vote. So um, I think with those you know, potential changes that maybe come out of a, a, a draft vote, I could support Mr. Kura's motion. Um, one other, point I want to make as far as the, the, the chief's advisory committee. And again, back in the earlier this year, I, um, over your objection, Mr. Weinstein, but I, I, I said that I think the year is better served allowing the, 
the chief to go ahead with her advisory committee because at least that would get underway and, and it was almost like a two-pronged process. I'm now at a point where I, I think these can be done in, in, in parallel. The chief can have her advisory committee and with the right makeup here and with the inappropriate charge, um, I, I, I'd be comfortable with supporting a study committee. And, and I do think the, um, the end date should be extended because I don't think there's gonna be a lot of work done between now and, and um, the spring 2021 town meeting. Yeah, Mr. Carr, so just to clarify and to follow up on what Mr. DeCourcy said in your motion. So, you know, I also got hung up on the limited charge of this committee in this Warren article as far as, you know, I know it's, we, we went back and forth last time about police civilian advisory board when it was really leaning towards a review committee that, you know, gets involved in just disciplinary actions. Um, so, it could be that that's what the committee comes up with, but is the charge that you're in, in your amended motion giving to this committee just to review policing policies in general and come up with recommendations for town meeting rather I, than just specifically to a review board or advisory committee? I mean, I think it's, it's really, it's an alternative um, complaint mechanism. So, I mean, you could add that as a clause you know, police civilian review board independent from police department with authority or whatever. The, that, the language that's in the, the, the warrant article say, or other alternative um, complaint or dispute resolution mechanism. In other words, because we want them to look at comp comparable communities, right? Comparable to Arlington. And it may, it may well be that they find some communities that have an alternative um, uh, mechanism that 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 is a little bit different from what's outlined here. So I, I think the point is well taken. So it's not policing in general. It's just it's no the committee's charge is to no my understanding a oh, way for citizens to lodge complaints. Yeah, and, oh, and honest, uh, Mr. Chair, with your indulgence, I mean my my understanding has been that the the uh, chief's advisory uh, council will be an ongoing committee that that will be considering um, uh, community policing in general um, on an ongoing basis. So that I think this a study committee should have a very defined charge. That, that's my feeling. And, and, I, and I think that Mr. DeCourcy's other points are well taken as well. All right, and Mr. Weinstein, do you have any one or two minute? Yeah, <laughs> this is a lot of ground. Um, I, want, I, I, I just wanted to emphasize that, that uh, um, there is a difference in what the, the chief advisory uh, committee would be doing, at least that's my understanding, um, and what a civilian review board would be doing. And I think Joe is right that the primary function once it's up and running, I'm saying, you know, if, if, it, if one is actually created, in my mind, is to give citizens um, a, a, an alternative and a safe way to file a complaint about their interaction with the police, if, if they've had one, uh, a problem, outside of the police department. And that's the main thing. I know that the police department has its own internal uh, way of investigating complaints and receiving complaints, but I know uh, from having been involved in this anti-racism thing for a couple of years now, uh, that there are people who have encounters with the police in Arlington, primarily who are people of color, um, uh, are not trusting, uh, are, uh, do not trust the process uh, or that pathway to go to the police to complain about the police, feeling as if it just puts another target on their back. Um, and we've heard plenty of, you know, anecdotal uh, experiences relayed about this. So I think that it would be very helpful and I think it would also be very valuable to, in, to build the trust in the Arlington Police Department to have some kind of alternative way sort of a, a release valve, a, a place for people to go uh, to a board that actually has the authority to investigate. Um, and uh, 
so I, I, I think that that's number one. There is a difference and I think that they can, be, they can operate simultaneously, but I don't think the chief's um, uh, function is necessarily, is going to be the same as, as what I envision this uh, board to do. The, um, the other question I had is that I, I, I'm uh, in listening to Joe's uh, review of, and, and, and the others uh, that Steve made and, and others have made. Um, I'm not opposed to, to uh, most of it. Uh, and I, I understand the need to change the reporting time and the timetable because uh, the 2021 uh, town meeting is too close. Um, I was hoping that maybe if this study committee was created, that it might give some kind of an interim report to the 2021 town meeting. Uh, because frankly, I mean, what's, what's, what everybody is waiting for, at least <laughs> among my peers, is some kind of study or report out from this so that we can then use that data to actually craft a warrant article that would create uh, some kind of civilian review board. Um, so that's why it was, uh, you know, there was a, a, a bit of pressure to try to get the study committee to report out sooner, but I get it and everything, everything is put on hold by uh, the coronavirus. Mr. Carroll. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yep, Mr. Carroll. I, I think it's important uh, to the, the, Mr. Weinstein, understand that if, if this committee is, is study committee is created by town meeting, every, every committee created by town meeting has the right to report at, at any annual or special town meeting. That, that, is all, that opportunity is always there and it's, it's yep. utilized. Some committees use it and some committees don't. Okay, and, and the final thing I just wanna say is I'm, I'm uh, uh, poised and, and willing and able to make amendments to the language to try to satisfy most all of your uh, concerns. Um, I guess I'll leave it at that. Okay. Hey, Mr. Diggins? So, um, so yeah, uh, so what I'll say is that I, I support the notion of, of real research, I mean, and looking into I mean, whether this is one, a good idea. And, and so if it passes that, you know, then how do we do it? I mean, my impression I mean, was that it was more a uh, review board as opposed to an alternative complaint board. Um, which to me is a different mechanism because with review, I mean, you actually have an independent review of complaints that are brought um, before the police uh, department. You actually have an independent uh, review of, of what the police department does. It's, it's broader to a certain extent. And I think if we are aiming at like an alternative complaint in, um, mechanism, in, I think you might be just translocating the, trans the trust issue to another body, and and I was just suggest that you think about how you, whatever body you would create as a result. Let's say Tom meeting does uh, decide to create I mean an alternative complaint board that you somehow maintain the level of trust that you think isn't present in the current environment. Um, so I just put that out there, I mean, but because this is purely research, and, and I will support it. Uh, and, and I'm interested in what comes out of it because I'm just always curious that way. And, and again, I will, will want to emphasize what Mr. Kuro said about the police advisory group because I mean, even when I campaigned, I said I mean, I'm in favor of review, I mean, of a research group, um, but I also really supported I mean, the notion of a advisory group I mean, uh, at, that would have I me mean, large reach, it could be a committee as big as we want it to be, but that would persist for a long time. So I'm very happy that the police chief is moving forward with that and that that will go on regardless of what happens uh, with the results of this um, article. Thank you. Is there any Mr. Chair, I, I move the 11 o'clock rule to 11.45. Yes, so ah. um, a second. And if I could just... Um... <laughs> Definitely second Mr. Carroll's motion. And um, as I stated previously, the uh, Chief Flaherty has ar already established a committee. Um, my colleagues want to vote to study forming a committee that the Chief has already formed. That's fine. Um, but I really want to be 
um, uh, in terms of myself, that we cannot have, as we have over the past year, that people come in and, and speak for people of color, that they say, Diane M, Joe C, uh, John K um, has this thing. Um, I don't think we should be going down that road. I think there's been um, some some damage to our community in terms of that we uh, have, have white people of privilege that have been representing um, people of color, whether they're black or brown, which I have in my family myself, um, that they come in and speak that way. I think we really need to find a balance here because I, I, I'm, I somewhat get frustrated that um, there's a need identified and um, there are people saying they're representing that need, um, but th that need needs to be more identified. So um, my, my only kind of frustrate, frustration hesitation is Chief Flaherty already has formed a committee. Um, if my colleagues want to form a study committee to form a committee that the chief has already formed to see if there's any deficiencies in that, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in total agreement with that, but I don't think um, if there are deficiencies that I, I think certainly jo Mr. Kiro can bring forward in terms of, you know, seniors and um, our black student union can bring forward in terms of, um, high school students that, that aren't representative, but I, I really want to make sure we draw a real fine line on that to make sure that, that we're moving forward and not sort of, sort of getting sidetracked on that. So, um, right. thank That's, you, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to look to the board to see. So, for one thing, Attorney Heim, let's vote on our motion to extend the meeting. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Kiro? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Unanimous vote. We were extended to 11.45. So I do want to go to public comment. Um, so at this time, if the public wishes to speak up to the article, please use the raise hand function on your Zoom app and we'll formulate a list. There are five hands, uh, six hands raised, Mr. Hurd. Right, and we will close the list at those six hands. Can you just let me know all six names? Yep, uh, Elizabeth Dre, Judith Garber, Rajiv Sunaya, Rebecca Gruber, and Lynette Martin. I must have missed one because I have five. Elizabeth Dre, Judith Garber, Rajiv, Rebecca Gruber. Oh, I, I think I, I missed Anna Hankin, sorry. And an additional hand of Sandra Mustaho just went up. And Ed Tremblay just raised his hand as well. All right, you can promote Mrs. Dre. We have a number of people, so we will set our three minute time limit and just ask all speakers to adhere to the three minute rule. I think you need to unmute Mrs. Dre. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, uh, Elizabeth Dre, Jason Street, town meeting member for Precinct 8. Uh, I'd like to thank you for this great discussion um, and stress how, uh, well, how important it is that I think that we have representation of black and brown residents on this um, review board. So I would love to see the study com committee include members of Envision 
Arlington Diversity Task Group, the Black Student Union, maybe the Black alums, um, as a substitution for representative of the Equal Opportunity Advisory Committee, as uh, Mr. Caro suggested. I also agree with uh, Mr. DeCourcy that this should be viewed as a parallel committee to the Chief's Advisory Committee. The Chief's Committee is not a substitution for this warrant article. The chief's proposal is presented by her as a forum for discussion to present uh, a diverse spectrum of viewpoints by community members. In contrast, the Civilian Review Board is independent from the police department with the authority and resources to receive and investigate complaints, review police services, and make recommendations for their improvements. These are two very different things, and there is room for both in Arlington. And supporting this should not be seen as not supporting the police chief's proposal because the civilian review board will actually help the police department by rebuilding trust within the community. This will be good for the community and it will be good for the police department. And I would like to thank the town manager for his leadership last July when he signed the Massachusetts Municipal Leaders Pledges. The leaders pledge principles and action on systematic racism in our communities uh, and committed to to declare that racism is a public health crisis and worthy of treatment, assessment, and financial investment in order to eradicate negative impacts. And part of that pledge is to act locally and to make a change by implementing local principles of local police actions. And one of those promises is to discuss and explore the possibility of establishing a meaningful and effective civilian review board. The select board's approval, uh, a vote of yes, for the warrant six will help move the town of Arlington towards fulfilling the town manager's promise. Thank you. Thank you. Then we have Ms. Garber. Hi there. Hi, just say your name and address for the record. Uh, Judith Garber, 130 Massachusetts Avenue. Um, I'm speaking in support of Warrant Article 6. Uh, I believe it's important that we have civilian oversight of the police department that is independent of the police department. Um, I agree with what Jordan and others have said about uh, there's room for both the police chief's uh, discussion group as well as the civilian review board. Um, I know from um, stories that I've heard from people in Arlington that there have been several instances of racial profiling and mistreatment of residents, but not all of them may have been recorded because as Jordan was mentioning, lack of trust in the system when the only place to report it is um, the police department. So uh, having a civilian review board would give all residents or people traveling through Arlington a safer place to report such incidents. Um, and it can go coexist with the, the chief's advisory committee. Um, and I think having the study group uh, to study this for a year would help ensure that any civilian review board that is recommended will have real teeth and lead to real change. So um, thank you for your support and consideration. Thank you. Um, and we have Rajiv. Hi, Mr. Saneha. You just say your name and address for the record? Sure thing. Hi, uh, my name is Rajiv Soneja. I am, uh, 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 I reside on 13 Mary Street. Um, I'm here to um, voice my support for this Civilian Review Board article. Um, I also want to state I'm uh, part of the Arlington Human Rights Commission, although I speak in a personal capacity today. Um, I was involved in the deliberations uh, with the Consensus Building Institute uh, uh, last year. Uh, the, the report was commissioned by the CBI was in itself because of the mishandling of the town's response to the racist writings of the Arlington police officer. So one of the key recommendations to come out of that report was, and I quote, develop additional structures, policies, and actions for the town of Arlington to ensure that Arlington and its employees live up to the values and aspirations of Arlington residents. So among many other suggestions that were made by people who were involved in that report, one of the key recommendations was to create a, a review board or a, a community-based entity to advise on community police actions. So I believe the creation of the study group 
for the CRB is an essential step to bridge the, the gap that was created as a result of those uh, writings. Um, I would strongly encourage the select board to vote yes on this, uh, on this study group. I would also encourage that the select board somehow form a me mechanism so that uh, people from marginalized communities are part of the CRB. Um, that includes people of color, people from uh, of suffering from disabilities, um, uh, people uh, as uh, recommended by Mr. Kuro, people from the Council of Aging, um, but it has to be a diverse panel to be able to oversee the police department. And I, I, did, I finally just want to stay uh, to Ms. Mahon's comments. Uh, speaking the truth uh, does not harm the community. We harm the community when we do not speak the truth. Thank you. All right. We have Ms. Gruber. All right, Mrs. Gruber, if you can just state your name and address for the record. Rebecca Gruber, Pleasant Street. And I'll keep my remarks brief since the prior speakers have all been so eloquent. I just want to say that I am very excited about this article and I certainly hope it will be supported by the select board. Um, having such a study, I think, is a strong move forward in creating a healthy and responsive relationship between the police and our community. And I don't think this is an either or situation with having such a study potentially leading to a board and the police department having its own committee of advisors. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Henkin. Ms. Hankin, if you could say your name and address for the record. Hi, Anna Hankin, Marion Road. Um, I just wanted to speak in support of the warrant article to create a civilian review board study committee, potentially leading to a board, hopefully leading to a board. I think that having a really diverse study committee is very important to making sure that people feel heard, seen, and represented. Um, and I feel like having a civilian review board gives people a sense that it's not just police who have an interest in protecting other police who are then policing police. It will go a long way to rebuilding the broken trust that the community currently has towards the police department. And it, I think, will give them a better sense of the problems in the community when you can speak freely to a board, they can transfer those problems to someone else. When you have to, it, there's a reason that professors have you give anonymous feedback at the end of a semester, right? And that's a similar thing here. The chief's forum is useful, but it's not going to get all of the information they need. And this not only gives you an outside review board that allows you to have an outside review, it gives you a way to communicate that isn't monitored by police directly. So you feel like you can actually express your needs. And I think the town really needs that. And we need to respect those needs of our community. Um, and I'm really in support of this warrant article. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I'm having trouble reading my writing, but I think it's Mrs. Master. Uh, my, I think Mustaho, is that Sandra? Mustaho, sorry. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Sandra Mustaho. I'm at 191 Park Avenue. Um, I will also be brief since most everybody that has uh, spoken has um, has commented on uh, in a similar manner, but I would just like to express uh, my support of this article. Um, I'd also like to clarify that this is uh, just a study and it does not actually create anything. 
um, and it would be a completely separate to the, the chief's parallel committee. Um, further, I feel like it is really an important step towards uh, you know, building a bridge to the community and building trust. Um, also, I, I feel that it is really just the beginning of trying to uh, show our commitment to reform in Arlington. Um, so again, I really just want to express my support and I really hope that we'll take it into consideration. Thank you. All right, we have Lynette Martin. Hi, Ms. Martin. If you could just say your name and address for the record. Lynette, can you hear us? Yep, there you go. Sorry. Can Sorry. you hear and see me now? We, we can hear you. We can't see you yet. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm on my, um, my phone today. So, I, oh, here we go. Got it. Hi. No, I can see you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to echo um, what Elizabeth Dre and Rajiv Soneha and everyone else has said. Um, I want, uh, I would like to see uh, select board members recognize that this is very different from uh, an advisory board to um, the APD. Um, it needs to be independent and separate. And um, I would agree with what select person Mahone said. It would be great to hear more from uh, diverse residents, people of color. Um, but we need to create a non-hostile place to do that, where people feel that they can come to these meetings, be heard. Um, we need to continue to have cultural competency training. I was sort of taken aback by Ms. Mahone's citing that she has members of her family who are people of color. That's the kind of thing that um, just uh, makes it seem like, you know, I can't be racist, I have a black friend type of um, stuff that just does not make these meetings um, feel welcoming to diverse members to participate. Um, I feel like there have been lots of people of color who have come forward and spoken in support of the Citizen Review Board and um, continue to address their concerns that they have in this community for um, some sort of oversight for our police department. And so I hope that we will see this uh, at least go forward into a study committee. Thank you. muted John. That's why I don't mute myself. Mr. Trumbly? <clears throat> Mr. Trumbly still with us? I lost him. I, I clicked on him and he disappeared. Um, we have him now, I think. No, he's there. Is he here now? Okay. Mr. Trumbly, if you say uh, name and address for the record. Uh, Ed Trumbly, um, 76 Wright Street. It's been 30 years since I ran into an Arlington police officer that I didn't trust all that much. Trumbly, I don't know if it's me, um, but can you go closer to your microphone? It might just be me. Um, so it's been 30 years since I ran into an Arlington police officer that I didn't trust very much. And, um, uh, I've, I've never felt like there was, if there was a big problem, there, there wouldn't be people that you could talk to about it, like the selectmen, for instance. Um, I think Julie Flaherty is a really good police chief and I think she is uh, fully capable of 
running a review board and and selecting good people to be on it I get a little concerned about there being uh, competing review boards that uh, that have kind of different different uh, agendas than than uh, than than good than just good community policing and uh, so I think um, I think we'll give Julia a chance to uh, to uh, put her board together, see what it looks like, see how it functions, and uh, if it's not working, then 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 we can revisit this again uh, idea again sometime in the future. But uh, for right now, I'd say let things let uh, let Julie run things and uh, uh, the way she is a professional sees fit because they do get a little uncomfortable about people who have no experience and no clue what the police have to put up with um, reviewing what they do thank you mr trembley and the, the last speaker in our public section is Laura Kisa. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So my name is Laura Kiesel. I live in Capitol Square. I just want to reiterate, I guess, what everyone else was saying. I think that um, it's really time that we try to rebuild trust in the community. I'm glad that that gentleman has had a nice, trustworthy experiences with APD, but that has not been everyone's experiences. I live in affordable housing um, where we are more heavily policed. And even though I, who am white, have never experienced anything, I have witnessed things that make me question having trust in the APD. And there needs to be places that we can go to appeal if we have concerns about that. And it needs to not always be the people who obviously have a conflict of interest in finding um, potential misconduct in their own department. Uh, so, I mean, in fairness, I just looked and watched the select board um, vote on a, against a parking waiver that it looked like the Arlington Police Department denied a person with a disabled child, despite that I thought we voted on a waiver program for people with disabilities and low-income folks. And I, I read that letter while I was listening to you all, and the police said, you know, if he has a medical emergency, just call the ambulance. And besides the fact that that's expensive and that also calling 911 can bring police, which maybe a person doesn't want for a medical emergency, it shows again a lack of understanding and biases against marginalized people, such as disabled people and disabled children. So there needs to be more accountability for these kinds of judgments. And I hope that this is a very small step, this committee, in looking into whether this review board could maybe just begin to address that. And I like to say that I have shared this experience with the select board before. I actually experienced police brutality in my family. And my uncle, my family was poor and we did not feel empowered enough to file a complaint. We started the process. There was very little back then. And we were so intimidated that we dropped the complaint and we were white. And so, and that's still, I do a lot of studies and data research on this as a reporter, and that's still a problem. Most people do not feel empowered to file complaints against the police, especially with the police, because of concerns about backlash. And that's exacerbated if you're marginalized by race, by poverty, by health. Which also leads me to very quickly state that if you're going to also be recruiting retired police officers, just stating, well, they don't have a formal disciplinary record doesn't address the concerns of people like me who know that that's not necessarily an ironclad way of making sure that police are not having more contact with marginalized people that they could harm. So again, I hope that you will consider this step. It seems like a very small step that may at least start to build trust in this community. Thank you. Two minutes and 57 seconds, good time. All right, um, so that ends the public comment portion. Um, I'll just ask the board, do, do you have any more questions for the proponent? 
All right, uh, Mr. Carl, any additional comments? No, no additional comments other than I think I indicated that I accept um, Mr. DeCourcy's suggestions. Yeah, Mr. Diggins? Uh, I was just hesitating. I was kind of trying to remember Mr. DeCourcy's suggestions and I have them. And also, yeah, um, I, I know no additional comments except um, yeah, except to, to say that uh, we should just be cognizant of how we define community. And, uh, and I think that's a big thing that we are going to need to explore when we take on um, this racial issues um, in a bigger sense lit, um, in the future as um, we've gotten, well, I'm sorry, I'm starting to fade here. So let me just stop. Uh, Mr. Corsi? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just very briefly, um, you know, I just want to clarify something I said earlier. When I talk about something running in parallel, I'm talking about the Chief Advisory Committee and the study group. Um, and, and I think the Chief should go forward with her advisory committee uh, right now. And, and you know, with the comments that Mr. Kerr made, I made as to having, you know, as, in, in my mind, as broad a scope as possible in terms of what's being reviewed and reported back to town meeting, you know, to the extent it includes other communities. Um, you know, that, that, that's the type of study that, that, that I was looking at um, over the next year, year and a half. Um, so I wanted to clarify the use of the term parallel. Um, it was more in terms of time right now um, than in terms of what something might be in the future. Ms. Mahan? Um, I'm certainly in favor of uh, having a study committee that runs concurrent with what the chief wants to do. And I mean this with all due respect. I know it's been brought into question in terms of the statements I made previously, but I do not want white people of privilege speaking for supposedly people of color that um, need to get an issue before Arlington, Arlington Police, Arlington Select Board, Arlington School Committee, Arlington whatever. I want to find a way that um, through the Chiefs Committee and the Warren article that um, people of color, black, brown, or otherwise, find a way to do that um, just because I, I've, I've been so entrenched in this um, and I'll take the insults to me saying, you know, um, just because you say, you know, someone who's a person of color. No, I don't. I have grandchildren and daughter-in-law, et cetera, who are people of color, um, who my neighbor across the street, who's on the human rights commission can certainly attest to. Um, and I don't want to bring them into this foray. Um, but because previous speakers to this Warren article have cast dispersions on that. I, I just want to make sure, I want to have the real conversation with the real vested parties where they feel safe. Because I understand not feeling safe having about a conversation. Um, so um, I, I'm willing to uh, also vote in support of this advisory committee, but I also have a lot of trust in Chief Flaherty uh, in terms of the, the committee that she's already constituted. But I always think we in Arlington, we should look at things and we can do it better. So I, I'm in favor of that. But I just want to make sure we're cognizant of that it, it seems like it's the same six or seven white people of privilege that talk about um, people who feel that um, they haven't been treated fairly. So I'd like to find a way that those actual pe people who do exist find a safe way to communicate that so we actually can get that to some resolution. So um, it's a little sensitive for me because, you know, my, me and my family, not so much me, but my family's been attacked, but um, we'll go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, and I can support the motion. I do want to just say, from my own personal opinion that I don't, I, you know, I think this came out of one individ, individualized event and we know that a new 
a number of residents were happy with the result. I don't think, you know, I, we've said before that we think that the vast majority of the APD is comprised of excellent officers who do amazing jobs for the community. And under Chief Flaherty's guidance in the community policing model, you know, we really do have the model policing department. But, you know, any department, any board, any part of town government can always, you can find ways to improve. Um, I don't think that it's a civilian review board that steps into disciplinary decisions on behalf of the town manager or the police chief is a good idea. There's a lot of considerations such as labor law and how any decisions that they make are gonna affect the town as a whole. Um, but I do think that this committee can, the charge that we've, we've given them and the expanded members that Mr. Carl has spoken of can come up with what a solution could look like. Um, and just, you know, again, this is a committee to determine what, if any, recommendation would go to town meeting. Proponents that want, if someone wants a civilian review board, they always have the opportunity at any town meeting to proffer that warrant article on their own outside of this committee. So I think this committee with its current makeup as recommended by Mr. Caro can come to a reasonable solution to address the concerns that we've heard from the community in the past few years. So with that, I will go to Mr. Attorney Heim, which looks like he has a comment anyways, but so we have what I would guess are two votes, correct? A vote on Mr. Caro's motion and then a vote on the article as suggested by Mr. Weinstein, or you can no, correct me if I'm wrong. No, Mr. Chair, usually the board takes one vote Yep. Um, and says that it recommends, if, in, if you're recommending positive action on this article, you basically take a vote to say, oh, we're recommending positive action and this is the motion that we recommend to the uh, town meeting. Now the board can instruct me to work with, you know, in the parameters of your comments and I can certainly confer with Mr. Weinstein and try to basically create something that's sort of mutually reflective of, of all the discourse here tonight. Um, or the board can just direct me to draft, you know, a motion and, and if there's disagreement, the, you know, substitute motions can always be submitted. I, I, it seems like from uh, what's a large dialogue here that there's a, at least a pretty good chance that what the board has sort of asked for from a motion from this will be amenable to Mr. Weinstein and there will be one motion before town meeting. I just have two very quick substantive things to raise. One is the diversity task group doesn't have a membership per se. It's a more fluid entity than that. So if one of the entities is going to try to appoint somebody who's a diversity task group we call them members, but sort of more participant. Maybe that vote should come from Envision Arlington Standing Committee out of you know people who come from diversity task group. Um, secondly, um, there's been some discussion about wanting to make sure that there's a diverse um, uh, group of uh, folks on this committee, whether they're designees of one body or another, uh, and how we've handled that in the past, because it can be difficult um, from a legal perspective to reserve a certain amount of spots for a person of, of, of this sort of uh, ethnicity or sexual orientation or whatever, um, is we've put in language that basically says that the committee shall reflect the, you know, uh, diverse, you know, demographics of the town of Arlington as sort of more like, hey, appointing authorities, you need to make sure that you're um, putting somebody on that, that, that helps to represent, you know, a myriad of experiences, viewpoints, and things of that nature. Does that make sense uh, to you folks? Yeah, Mr. Carroll? Uh, yeah, that makes sense. And uh, Mr. Heim, if it, if it helps at all, I mean, a lot of what I was talk, talking about, I have a lot of written notes that I can give you that I think capture the points that I raised, that, that if, if that would help yeah. in putting together a, a uh, recommended vote and comment for our next meeting. I, I know it's late, so I, I'm happy to take all of, I'll watch this dialogue again I'm happy to take all the board members sort of feedback on this, talk to Mr. Weinstein, try to put together one motion 
Um, obviously, the comments here might represent a diversity of viewpoints. It's maybe not everybody's thinking the exact same reason for saying this is the recommended vote. Uh, and that's okay. We have plenty of comments that reflect, you know, this is what some board members thought, this is what other board members thought. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll draft a vote that builds on what you've commented here. I'll try to work with Mr. Weinstein and, and hopefully we'll have something that everybody supports when it comes back for final votes and comments in terms of its form. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. Yes, uh, in terms of um, the diverse uh, representation, I mean, I, I will say there's probably no harm, I mean, if there is an over-representation of, um, let's just say, if it over-represents over, um, minorities. I mean, uh, uh, I think maybe for the study group purposes, I mean, that might uh, be a good thing in this situation. I mean, so I'd hate for it to be, such that it's limited I mean, by that statement, so that overrepresentation isn't a problem, and, but underrepresentation is. Okay. I think I hear you loud and clear, Mr. Stiggins. I, I, I hope that what I put together for everybody will reflect the nuances of, of all our discussions. Thank you very much. All right. So we have a motion by Mr. Carl, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Attorney Hunt. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kuro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Yeah, right. And that brings us on to what will hopefully be the quickest more article hearing in history. Okay, that having been said, Mr. Chair, I move the 11 o'clock rule to 12. Yes. Do a second? Second. Chang Hang? Mrs. Mahan. Oi Bay, yes. Mr. DeCorsi. <laughs> yes. Mr. Diggins. Let's break the last meeting's record, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mr. Kiro. Regrettably, yes. No one can say you're not earning that stipend, right? Uh, Mr. Hurd. Yes. Uh, All right. We have a hearing on warrant article 10. Acceptance of legislation, Gold Star Family Tax Exemption. Um, we have Mr. Town Manager, or Mr. Attorney Heim, do you want to? I'm sorry, if the manager would prefer to speak about it, that's fine, that's fine. me, of course. I, I, mean, I will simply say this is filed at the request of uh, Director of Veteran Services, Jeff Chunglo. Uh, it provides um, pre a tax exemption for Gold Star families, of which we have a small number in uh, Arlington. Uh, I certainly supported uh, the request as, a, as a, I think, a, what could be a modest benefit given to people who have experienced the ultimate sacrifice in their family and would be, I'd be asking for favorable action on behalf of the board tonight. Thank you. Mrs. DeCorsi. Yeah, move favorable action. Mrs. Mahan. Second. Mr. Diggins, any comments? No comments. And Mr. Carroll? No, let's vote it. <laughs> All right, and I will support as well. Um, I will open it up for any public comment with the raised hands function. Seeing none, Attorney Hyman. This is Mahan. Um, I, I want to say yes, thank you. And um, thank you to Jeff Chunglo and the Gold Star families um, that have given a, a great sacrifice to this. Thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kuro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Now I have to find my, all right. So that brings us to correspondence received item number 12 on our agenda, Lower Washington Street safety concerns, Regina Tavani and Lower Washington Street abutters. Do we have- Move we'll receipt, Mr. Chair. Move we'll receipt. Do we have a second? I'll second. Attorney, uh, sorry, Ms. Carroll? Uh, no further comments. Mr. DeCourcy? I uh, no further comment. Attorney Hyde. Well, I, I'll say one other thing. I, mean, I, I, I think we're going to boot that one over to um, Tech, or what does um, the, I think, Mr. 
Town managers have something to say. Yeah. I mean, reading through it, it's not immediately clear to me because it's a private way that it's a transportation issue, um, so much as a problem solving issue. So I was going to ask if I could have assistant town manager Ray Santilli uh, see if he can pull together a few departments and see what type of problem solving we can do. Um, you know, we're 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 not going to pave the road. That's uh, if it's a private way, but there might be some um, creative things we can do. Uh, working working with the the abutters as we've done in past circumstances, and I. I think we can start if we if we can start like that if the board supports that. Wonderful, nice. Can okay. Yep. Chayhan. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Shakiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. We do have new business at this meeting. <laughs> New business, Attorney Heim. No, sir. Mr. Chaplin. I'll pass tonight, thank you. Mrs. Mahan. It's a big, on to the next person. Thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Very, very briefly, I'm, and I'm glad it's before midnight. I just want to wish happy birthday to Mark <laughs> DeCourcy, my youngest, and uh, he's got 13, 11 more minutes left on his oh. birthday, 20 years old today. So happy birthday, God, Mark. God bless him. Well, we'll look forward to next year's birthday. <laughs> You're muted. Actually, right? yeah, I'm sorry. I have a couple, but I'm going to save it for another meeting. Right. Mr. Carroll. Just really one sentence, basically. I, I had never notified the board that I had applied for and been appointed as the municipal representative to the superintendent search screening committee. Mm. There was an Thank excellent field, field of candidates that, that has come in. Um, it's a really great committee. We'll be conducting interviews. We expect to be, uh, over the next two weeks, we expect to do deliberations on um, November 2nd to report out finalists to the school committee for the next superintendent. Thank you. And then no new business. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Mrs. Second. Mahan, second. By Mr. Diggins, Attorney Hyman. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Diggins. Yes. Securo. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. 10 minutes to spare. <laughs> if anyone has more new business. Seriously. Good night, everyone.